Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Jim Cornette Experience. Does a rising tide lift all boats, or is WWE's rating tsunami about to capsize AEW's minnow? It's a rainy day edition of the Jim Cornette Experience, and to join me, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, he's a champion at predicting which way the wind is blowing. The great Brian Last, everybody. North. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again, and it is a rainy day edition. That's the way it feels. It's a rainy night in Georgia. Just a rainy night in Georgia. I thought you were going with It's Raining Men from that first note. Well, see, that there's some of the notes kind of blend together with some of the things I sing. It just depends on... What genre of music it is. I'm versatile at all the styles, you know. Yeah, you sound like Alfalfa in all the styles. Hey! You sound like Alfalfa. Carl you know, Switzer. He, <laughs> he grew up to have a fine singing voice in between bouts of alcohol and drug addiction. You ever see any of the footage of him when he did grow up a little bit and he did some did cameos in film? grow up a little bit? Yeah, well, I mean, because you know him as a kid. Short pants, but he was five foot six, had a cigarette hanging out of his no, mouth. No, but after the Rascals, after the Rascals, when he would appear in a few movies and he would sing and he still sang like Alf Alf. <laughs> <laughs> well, that son of a bitch standing there sounds just like Alf Alf. Uh, well, we got weather issues today here in Louisville, Kentucky. It's rainy right now. And here's the thing. We've had this morning, Sunday morning, so far, very early, about a quarter of an inch of rain or whatever, but 45 miles south of here had between two and a half to three and a half inches this morning, and they've called for a flash flood alert. And then the weather, it, the, the forecasters are predictifying that later on today, it's going to clear up. It's going to get to like 93 degrees. And then another cold front's going to come through. And here's the deal. I said, well, if certain conditions are right, it could be a bust. But if certain conditions are right, it could be severe goddamn storms with possible tornadoes and golf ball size hail. So just in case, put everything under cover and goddamn get a fucking flashlight and a boat ready. So I don't know what the fuck's going to be happening here later. I tried to turn on the, uh, I'd seen the early local weather. But you know, these things with all the shit we've been happening, we've been happening. A lot of people don't think it'd be like it is, but it do. With a lot of the shit that's been happening here lately that we've been experiencing. <laughs> don't snicker at me already. We be happening. I'm, <laughs> we be, we be jamming it, jamming it. I'm 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 shaking like a dog shit and peach seeds now every time they say we're going to have severe weather because of all that shit that has happened here over the just the past few months as we have been recounting and testifying to here on the program. So around about 10 o'clock or so, I said, is there still any local news on that I can get an update from an hour ago on this fucking weather forecast and see the radar? And I'm flipping through the the local channels, right? Trying to find somebody might still have some news on. And I come upon one of the Sunday morning religious programs, and it's a local program. I didn't catch the title of it, but it, it was obvious it was a local program. But I hit info, and it said, coming from the such-and-such such church in Louisville, Kentucky. And I only it was like almost at the finish of the thing, because it was the top of the hour, so I was flipping around as the Nielsen folks do, trying to find this weather. And there is this, it's, it's apparently, it's one of the Catholic persuasion programs because they're the trappings. Or it's not like just, you know, L Luther E. Brown standing up with the book and a collar or just a regular old pastor with the weird hair thumping on the thing. He's got the fucking robe and the goddamn headdress. It looks like, that Japanese guy they brought out on AEW, on, on uh, Collision, the only thing different, that guy wasn't wearing a Pope hat. What was his name? The guy in all white. Which one are you talking about? Collision? Help me. The Japanese guy that came out. Oh, Naito. There, there you go. He was wearing a white fucking suit and a white cape. All he needed was the Pope hat 
and we'd have been kissing his ring. So this guy on this program here, he's at the pulpit or the podium or whatever they term that, and he's got the, the big outfit on, and he's holding up, I guess the proper terminology for it would be a chalice. It looks like a very, a very fancy medieval grog cup that you would expect on, like on Game of Thrones, they might be pouring the grog in this. You see, you get a mental picture of that now. Oh, I got a mental picture of this, yeah. Okay. And in his other hand, he's got what appears to be a white fudge-covered saltine cracker. And they've poured something, some liquid of suspicious nature in this grog cup, and he's got this goddamn white fudge-covered saltine cracker, and he holds them up almost like a god Randy Orton entrance where he's exulting and he's like, behold my cracker and grog or whatever. And then this woman start off camera, starts singing. And not only was she hitting all the notes, she was abusing them. Oh my God. I mean, they went, she went into a note and then back into another note and then back into the same note in the same, you think I'm bad now. See, I've got my own interpretive styling, but she was just flat. It sounded like somebody disemboweling a cat. So as she starts singing, then Sounds they, like styling. Hey, they cut to a shot of her and, and she was warbling like they were like that. And she's on the, I think she's on the, uh, the organ or she's on somebody's organ to be on television singing. And then the, apparently the, all the congregation is going to be invited down to have a piece of this white fudge covered saltine cracker and take a swig of this suspicious looking liquid. And they and by the way, when they cut cameras, not only are the cameras not white balanced, that means that each camera is seeing the same color in a different shade, so it's very disorienting there, but they're not even all in the same focus. So some, either that or that woman just had a hard night, and that was really what she looks like. But they cut to the wide shot, Brian. There's four people in this fucking, in this building. It's, it's massive pews. There's pew after pew after pew. There's no people. There's no people, Jerry. There's four elderly citizens coming up to take a bite of the cracker and get a sip, and they're doddering. I mean, to the, there's the elderly support where they're shaking. I, it wasn't the camera. The cameras were didn't have human operators. They were apparently all fixed and mounted. But they were shaking as they were standing there, and maybe this... It, if it wasn't for the age of them, you would have thought that it was a methadone clinic and they were junkies and they were handing out a, you know, a, a sip of the shit to get right. But they were so old, I, I can't imagine that would be the case. It's amazing what you can see on local television when you're just trying to find out what the weather's going to be. When I was a little kid and I would wake up early enough, but the cartoons weren't on yet, like on a weekend, there was that one religious channel that had Davy and Goliath. So I would watch that because that was claymation and it's fun and I didn't give a shit about whatever lessons they were teaching. It was fun and it was claymation. But if you tuned into that channel a little bit too early or a little bit too late, <laughs> there was this guy, he looked like Count Dracula, but like with white hair and he was just, everything was going, the collars and chains and he had eyebrows up and he's wearing just everything. He's just dressed like the ultimate, you would think he was the Pope, like an evil dark <laughs> Pope. But he wasn't. He was just some, probably lived in Rockville Center. I don't know who the guy was. But it was just crazy religious television, at least to me. I couldn't imagine anyone following this guy. Well, but here's the thing. If, if there was intelligent life, and I assume there is somewhere in existence. I don't think we qualify yet, really, as truly intelligent life here on Earth. But somewhere. But if there was intelligent life that actually cared to visit here or monitor us or our broadcasts. What the fuck do you think they must think when here's this fucking guy in, you know, a bedspread from the Waldorf Astoria exultifying a fucking saltine cracker and a, and a cup of grog and the whole procedure and the whole th stories that they all go through. If they just had, if they just caught on to the, inspirational network or whatever 
much less any of our news programs or what we consider entertainment. What would they think about the, the fucking people of Earth? When you say it was local TV, what was it? Was it a time buy or was it just local programming on local TV? No, it's, well, it, I don't know about these days, but at some point in the past when I was more involved in studying the ins and outs of the television programming industry, local television, especially on Sunday morning, local TV stations to qualify for their broadcast license had to devote some small period of time per week to uh, public affairs, religion, uh, news, uh, something of the uplifting public good, right, from back in the old days. And so most uh, stations would uh, eat up a, a good person. I mean, everybody had news, but it has to be public affairs or some civic goodness, right? A lot of the local stations would eat up some of the time that they were, were required to broadcast something of that nature on Sunday mornings with their religious programs because it was local. The coming from the, you know, Goose Creek Baptist Church or whatever, and people did watch it more than there was no such thing as infomercials in those days. And so that, and then the big. Obviously, we talked about televangelists here a while back, the clips on YouTube, but the big for-profit, you know, Pat Robertson's and Jim and Tammy's and, you know, the big names, Jimmy Swaggart, until they found out he liked Hoors, they, they were, a lot, in a lot of cases, time buys because they could afford it. But, you know, who high Baptist Church in fucking Snydeville is not going to be able to, you know, buy anything. They can't buy radio yeah. ads. So it's it's civic affairs. I wonder if religious time buys is a way to gauge how strong television is right now in terms of a transactional marketplace. Like if it is down significantly, you know, like when um when whoever it was, I forget who it was now. When they called what's Watts, it, what's it? When it, whatever, what's his name? When they called Watts and said there are no escort services right now in New Orleans. Oh, Scott Munns. You know, that kind of like ticker, that the, kind of An mark. economic barometer is, is what you were awkwardly and unwieldily trying to get a grip on there before it snuck away from you like a greased pig. An economic barometer. When Scott Munns found out there was no escort services operating in New Orleans, he knew the economy had tanked. So with religious programming time buys, I wonder if you can see something about the strength of the television market just based on that. Well, I, but maybe it's more about the strength of the God market. How many people are into God? We, you know, we got to get in on the God business. People are given to God these days. So we got to have our infomercial in there. So they'll give us some of it. But with less young people watching TV than ever before, more and more young people don't even have TVs. That's where it becomes an interesting thing. Though. I don't think the audience for Sunday morning religious programming is necessarily anybody under 75. Oh, that's true. That's true. And and those people basically are the ones that are most easily preyed upon because they remember when a majority of people still bought that line of business and most of them weren't, well, I say most of them weren't, most of them weren't openly crooked back then. How did we get there? Um, it's your show. It, well, it's though no, it's the weather. That's what we were talking about, the weather. But it's your show. Which if uh, hopefully will not be chaos later on here in Louisville, Kentucky, so that uh, my electricity, oh my God, if my electricity goes out for the forbidden doer, maybe that, that would be a good trade, a loss of power so I've, has prevented me from watching or recording Forbidden Door. That might be a good trade. I think a few of them are on the pre-show, but they've announced like three more matches. Oh, what the... <sighs> you know, yesterday, I'll tell you what, the Monroes were here, and for only the second day this year, I actually got out in the yard and and worked and communed with nature. It was sunny, it was hot, sweated some some poundage off, got some exercise, was out there with the pole saw and the, the limb lopper and spraying the weed killer, and they were carrying rocks and things. They do that well. And 
by Cracky, the only tweeting going on was the birds in the trees. And then now we are here. I am back on the internet, back here with you, electronically connected to you. And you're telling me they've added three more matches to the 17 matches they had on this card. Every single one of them involving somebody that's never been on their fucking television or we haven't seen till last Tuesday. I'm trying to see. I mean, it's a big graphic with a little... There's a couple trios matches. Stu Grayson versus El Fantasmo. Oh, good Lord. Also, we have Swerve. Is and... anybody going to set the seats on fire in, in Toronto, Canada? On this already 14-match card, if we don't see Stu Grayson and, and fucking El Orgasmo. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, El Orgasmo may be something on this show, but Stu Grayson's a local boy. Make everyone happy. Oh, God, he's got to be in his hometown. Oh, I see. Okay. And then it looks like Swerve and a couple of the uh, associates of the embassy or whatever that is against... The, 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 Mo, the, the Mogul embassy. I'm not sure. Maybe... Rocky Romero and Trent and someone else. Oh. And then there's another trios match. It looks like maybe oh, Jeff Cobb's in this one. He's oh. a uh, self-ordained Stephen P. New client, apparently. But <sighs> how many? And they're all six man. So they've just announced another fucking, well, two of them. So they've announced another, say, 12, 14, 15 more guys on the card that we talked about was endless the other day. They took what was, uh, at that point, a one-match pre-show with Athena versus Billy Starks and added three more matches to Zero Hour. Four matches on Zero Hour, leading into the 11-match. No match wonder table. MJF said, put me on first. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later on, but he's he, even though he's on first, he's still going to be fifth. And the guy that's on 13th is going to be 17th. And it'll be, do they have such a thing as, as a curfew in Canada? They're going to go to Monday, aren't they? You know, WrestleMania 3 had an intermission. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. It worked. Anyway, so speaking of intermissions and interruptions and service interruptions, uh, we, we should mention this real quick. In that... We have, uh, we are eliminating, Brian, you and I, we're, we, you know, some people term folks like you and I control freaks. I prefer to say that we are exacting professionals. That's what I prefer to, exacting, profe that, that need the highest standards, not only from ourselves, but also from our associates. And that is why that heretofore up until now there's only been a tiny link in this chain of this programming that we disseminate to the masses to the cult of cornet to all the listeners out there not only the arcadian vanguard shows the the all of these shows there's only one tiny link in that chain from the time that it emanates from our mouths until the time that it assaults the ears of the listeners that is not completely and utterly under our control. It's noted that we are independent podcasters, that we are not grouped with any other shows, that we are not, we don't follow the beaten path. We do our own thing, which is why that we've been so blindingly successful. The magnitude of us sometimes intimidates people. But nevertheless, there was this one little link in this whole chain that was outside the circle of trust, that was not quite up to our standards. And we have had to make some rectumcations or rec rectif rectifications. We've had to rectify some things. And the folks are not only about to get a more pleasing and reliable audio experience, downloading experience, all kinds of experiences from the experience and all our other programs. But we're going to have a, a wonderfully entertaining story to tell in the next few weeks also. But if you've been having problems downloading us or Spotifying us or whatever the goddamn kids call the procedure, that is very soon going to be coming to an end as we bring everything 
into the circle of trust and under our control. You hear that? Yeah. I started up the wood chipper. If you fuck with us, you go in the wood chipper. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Everything is coming in-house. Everything's going to be done the right way. Back to the wood chipper. And and there is some, there's wood chipper fodder out in the backyard. We just haven't wheeled it all in yet. But over the next few weeks, I would expect that some some chipping will be done. Um, You know, let, how long, we've been talking for a while. Is it? Some of it wasn't even on tape. I forget how long we are into this program. We should get to the business of the program. Don't you think? I'm, so, I'm still over here with the wood chipper. Well, hold on, because we've got to make sure it's got enough oil in it to grind up all this grease that we're about to throw in it here soon. Should we talk real quick about just the... People were asking about this the other day when we were recording and we had all the news going on and we were disseminating that and we we glossed over it and now it has come to pass that I don't know what this incident is called. I don't know what this thing was. It's not a submarine. It was a a, a, a diving bell. I don't know what the fuck you call these things. They're they're modern technology. But the incident that happened, apparently now we know what happened. It imploded this craft of whatever description. Not exploded, but imploded while they were going down to look at the Titanic. And obviously, I haven't studied the lives and careers of these people that were on board. Uh, and we didn't wish them ill and we're not, you know, making mockery of their demise. But at the same time, so many people were asking because of my well-known views and thoughts on flying in airplanes, this would seem to be the complete opposite, polar opposite. And we were getting tweets and emails of what I thought and would I get. Obviously, the answer is no. Everybody knows that. But help me ex understand this, Brian, because this is not like this wasn't an officially sanctioned government research expedition. This was an independent guy that just had a lot of money and liked the Titanic and has been doing this and taking people to see the Titanic two and a half miles on the bottom of the ocean deep. Well, first of all, it's not just someone who likes the Titanic. It was a business. Everyone who was on that ship, other than the captain who owned the business or on the part of the business, or ran the business, were paying $250,000 a pop. Jesus Christ! But then how... It, how can you just have your own business where you take people to the bottom of the fucking ocean? Shouldn't there be some kind of law against just the concept of that? I guess. You know, again, it's not a submarine. It's a submersible. I've been in a submarine, and... I never thought about where they licensed her. <laughs> I guess maybe well, I should no, have. Because, well, no, because, you know, Johnny Jackoff in the old days before the internet made stupid people billionaires, Johnny Jackoff couldn't go just have his own fucking submarine. It was a fucking government project of the Navy or whatever to have a submarine or or a Oceana oceanographic institutes. So where Jacques Cousteau, he didn't even go to the goddamn bottom of the fucking ocean. But it had to be some kind of controlled environment or governmental agency that, you know, with people crawling all over this fucking thing, like the goddamn Jupiter 2 blast off on Lost in Space, where, they, you know, they had the teeming minions doing all that work. You know, they had a feature about this on CBS Sunday morning, maybe a year ago, and they just replayed it today as we are recording, because it was timely, where... Their reporter was on the Titan and they were going to go down and there was a problem. And like after nine minutes, they had to come back up. But he showed you it was being run by a video game remote and not even like a PlayStation, but like an off brand video what? game remote. It was run by a touch screen. There was one button to press to turn it on. 
there were experts that thought the combination of the different materials after several visits, I guess, I don't know what you would call it, several trips back and forth due to the compression, due to everything that happens to the materials, that it would eventually collapse like that. <sighs> hearing a lot of these things, the man who died with the ship, the man who ran it, he dismissed a lot of this stuff. He did not want Apparently. regulation. He didn't want regulation. He didn't want oversight. He didn't want... He actually flat out said that other people's concerns were wrong. And this is what happens. Did, did, you, did you see a picture of this thing? It looked like a freezer that my mom used to have sitting in the garage. It was... It, 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 it was I mean, I could see... If you were taking somebody snorkeling, but two and a half miles deep, the pressure is apparently 400 times what it is at the surface of, of the earth. So when they say imploded, and like you said, apparently the materials, they said a stress crack in something. When it got down there, suddenly it just goes <laughs> and squish. That's imploding sounds worse than exploding. And so what the fuck? Eh, eh. Take, go to, send the goddamn thing down with a camera, take a picture, bring it up to me, and I've seen the Titanic, right? Well, let me, that, let me ask you about that. That's a very interesting point that I wanted to ask you about. We have had explorations to the Titanic. I think they discovered it in, what, 85, 86? So it's now over 30 years, 35 years. There's now a digital print where they took so many high-resolution underwater photographs of both ends of the ship that there is a digital print that is so fine. I mean, you could zoom all the way in and see serial numbers on, I think it was uh, the blade. So, I mean, it's really incredible. Do you think they should be selling to tourists, and that's really what it is, trips to the Titanic either because of where it is, or because it's the mass grave of however many people. Well, I mean, you know, I think that falls under the category of we can't grieve forever. I mean, you know, the, the, where, where's the cutoff line of 100 years ago or 500 years ago, or then we moved all of the Native Americans' burial grounds to put in fucking shopping malls, so where's the cutoff point, right? At yeah, least and I saw poltergeist. These fucking people up. And I saw poltergeist. I know what happened because of that. Well, there you go. Yeah. It's in the TV. But no, but seriously, every you know, the on a variety of, of notes, the Native Americans or the Indians, as we called them when I was a kid, were fine right here in their homeland until we showed up and fucked them all around. But we've We've ground their bones to make our bread. So that was 200 years ago. So now 100 years ago, we can't go and goddamn take a picture of the fucking boat that somebody sank in. I think that's a little dollar, a day late and a dollar short. Not but, that you can't, but you're selling tickets to do it. Well, but either that or I'm not, that's the point is, I'm not talking about because it it's a mass grave site. And besides that, most of the people probably jumped off the boat and floated away or got eaten by sharks anyway, so they shouldn't be figured into this equation. People don't want to go down there and see a fucking skeleton. They want to go down there and see the goddamn prow of the boat that Leonardo da Vinci or whatever his fucking name is. DiCaprio. Him too. They were both there and they were screaming, we're the kings of the world. Well, that's what people want to see, but goddamn, it's two and a half miles just because I want to see uh, twinkle, twinkle, little star, the fucking, with the dog-faced gremlin star. What is it? One of those things. I can't remember my astronomy. I was too young. But you know that dog-faced gremlin star. Does that mean that I, if I've got enough money, somebody should be allowed to shoot me into space in a fucking rocket? Isn't there some governmental agency that ought to say, you know what, for, for everybody's own good, Nobody's allowed to go more than a mile in either direction unless they're fucking licensed and bonded. I don't know, but fuck that. I don't want to go to Mammoth Cave anymore, and I live here. Because I'm thinking, well, it's been this way for 
thousands of years. Well, goddamn. It, it, the way we fucked up the top of the ground, there's no telling what's going to happen underneath. The Corvette Museum in Bowling Green, 30 miles from Mammoth Cave, caved in, swallowed fucking multiple six-figure Corvettes. What if I'd have been in Mammoth Cave and those Corvettes had landed on my head? See, these are the things I think about. What were we talking about? The Titanic. Well, it's you, still do there. Any, do you have any personal fascination with the Titanic? Well, I like the story. You and, like the story? You think it's a nice story? Well, no. It, I'm aware of the... It, it's, it's a good pithy story. It's pithy. All the way around. It's pithy. The crash, of the, the crash, the sinking of the Titanic is a pithy story. Yes. Well, because of, the, you know, not only was it the maiden voyage and people had to eat their words that it was unsinkable and many books and motion pictures and everything have sprouted from this and blah, blah, blah. It's a very pithy story. You can sink your teeth into it. But I don't have any more particular fascination to it than... I can understand the idea of shipwrecks and Spanish galleons and, you know, whatever the fuck at the underneath, uh, underneath the ocean is are cool. And the curse of the Oak Island syndrome there. We want to see what's underneath there, but goddamn, I ain't going to be going down there, digging around, poking around where I don't belong. And not, they ought to send the incredible Mr. Limpet. Then he could report back. See, you need you need a double agent, somebody that's part fish, and part human. Maybe Shark Boy can get booked. They're so lucky they changed the company from Titan Sports for a moment like this. <laughs> Titan implodes the headlines. All righty. Anyway, speaking of Titan is exploding. We'll talk about that later on. But we, you know, the the time has come, Brian. The recurring segment that we have here at, at the top or early on in most of these programs dedicated to our lost and fallen furry friends. Yes, folks, it's Reggie's Corner. <laughs> Reggie's Corner. We're here to talk about your good boys and girls. Reggie's Corner. We're so sorry they're dead now. That's still wrong. That's still I, wrong. I know. He's going to go to hell. We know it. This guy. What was this guy's name? I don't know if I want to give it now. No, it's Well, not. he ought to be outed <laughs> for his. Well, he's a good guy, obviously. He meant well with this. His name is Matt O'Donnell. Well, Matt O'Donnell. Hope you cross that rainbow bridge right along with him. Will you stop it? That's not well, nice. Well, he's just terrible making people laugh about something like you this. You liked it just fine until I said it was terrible. <laughs> well, then somebody's got to take up for something. I don't know. <laughs> um, Dan from South Wales, UK. Uh, he and his wife are upset. They lost their 15-year-old colleague, Maddie, who uh, both of them loved him, but especially... Uh, or uh, her, I should say, but especially uh, Dan's wife, Maddie, had helped her through a couple of bouts with depression, so we're sorry to hear about Maddie, Dan. And also, Dusty from Las Vegas says, this past June uh, 2nd, my wife and I lost our 18-year-old cat, Allie, along with our, or Allie, along with our two other cats, listened to every episode of the Experience and drive through with us over the years. And enjoyed hearing both of your voices. And uh, do you think animal listeners should count towards our listener totals? I think they should. Because at least that's a set of ears. It's not just fictitious people that are being made up by the, like the WWE. But Alley Cat, that's cute. Alley. The, so Dusty, we're sorry to hear about that. Uh, Joshua from somewhere that we don't know, wrote Saturday, June 17th, we lost our English bulldog, Winston. Winston was a few months shy of being nine years old. I hate to hear that. He was a great dog and an even better friend. Enjoyed playing with his two sisters, Pearl and Mildred, and taking trips to the dog park and the river. <laughs> what? I like those names. Winston, Mildred, and Pearl. Well, you know, and there's another, Pearl and Mildred, another two names we talked about. Names that are going out of fashion. Winston. Was the last Winston. Boy was named Winston. Winston. 
Uh, Winston was Jerry Jarrett's middle name. Were you aware of that? Look at how much good it did him. Well, you know, Winston Churchill was big. He inspired a lot of people in World War II. That's right. Is that where it came he, from? Is that what inspired Jerry Jarrett's middle name? I th well, actually, I think it, it, it was his father's name or a family, father family name. A father, I yes. Believe. I believe it was his father's name, if I'm not mistaken. Jacob from Dothan, Alabama, didn't lose his father, but he did lose his border collie Brody at 17 years old, and he still loved to fetch frisbees and other toys. But they, these dogs, I'm, I'm, I'm excited that dogs are living longer lives these days because you're hearing about these good boys and girls that are 16, 17, 18. Medical science is wonderful. There are definitely um, some bad dogs, too. Uh, I need to go. There's never been a bad dog. Oh, I've seen only, a few bad ones. Only bad people. Bad people teach animals bad habits. Simon from Australia writes, I sent over a request a while ago to include my poor old cat Moolah in Reggie's corner. Whilst I wasn't too upset she didn't make the cut, Imagine my horror when I heard a different pet named Moolah inducted into Reggie's corner. But that's fine. In fact, I'm sorry my fellow cult member also lost their Moolah. It'd be great if both Moolahs were in there together. Simon, we officially induct your Moolah into Reggie's corner with the other Moolah. Well, who knew we'd have two Moolahs in the, uh, you said it's a Hall of Fame now, the Reggie's Corner Hall of Fame? Well, you know, in, in the, the spirit of the thing, I guess, whatever it is. Are we going to ever have a brick-and-mortar establishment? Then we'd have to go back and collect all these pictures again. That could be a show on A&E. Well, Moving along. Okay, go ahead. Chandler, from an, an unknown place in the, in the world, says, My dog of 17 years passed away Friday. I found him when he could fit in the palm of my hand, and we traveled the U.S. together. Eddie was the sweetest and most loving creature ever. He's seen more debauchery than most hair bands in the 80s and was an incredible wingman. My pickup line at the bar was generally, you want to head back to my place, I'll play guitar, and you can meet my dog. It yielded about a 93% closing percentage, and I owe that to Eddie. Chandler, we wish we could have met Eddie. He sounds like a wonderful pup. Brian, are you? Uh, are you, you said we. Your thought, sympathies. You were speaking for both of us. You said we. We wish we could have met Chandler. Well, I thought you would comment that. Well, I had a dog that I got a ninety-five percent closing rate percentage with. Well, we're sorry about the loss of Chandler. Uh, what was his name? Um, Jerome. Eddie. Eddie. Yeah, Eddie. loss of Chandler. No, it, who, no, you're losing the wrong person. It wasn't All right, Jerome? anyway. Oh, go ahead. And one more, one more for Reggie's Corner from Jordan in Stevenson, Scotland. And this one is kind of disturbing. Brian, I want to see what you think about this. Hello, Jim and Brian, longtime listener, first-time caller. I have just lost my third cat in 10 years due to poisoning. Poor Daisy was the latest victim in who knows how many feline murders. She was an old girl at 10 years old. That's not really old from the other ones we're hearing about. But she didn't deserve what just happened to her. Just the other day, she came in through the window with an unusual cry. Upon further examination, I noticed that her wee tongue was sticking out. It was a hideous black color. Now, before I go any further... Let me state that the same cat was shot seven years ago and survived. Bearing in mind that guns are 100% illegal in this country. What is, what is going on here? Apparently somebody's got it in for this cat, Daisy. She was taken to the vet, and it was determined that she had been poisoned. This is the third time that I have lost a cat to some heartless motherfucker. Now... There is a fat bastard over the fence who has pigeons, and I'm convinced that he is the culprit. But the police say that with no evidence, they can't do a thing. Hope all is well. Regards, Jordan. So. All right. So he's lost three cats. 
due to poisoning in 10 years. The same cat that just died was shot seven years ago but survived that. And there's a motherfucker, a fat bastard, over the fence that has pigeons that uh, Jordan here is looking suspiciously at. I'm wondering what Jordan may have done to this guy on the other side of the fence with the, the pigeon man, the bird man. I don't understand. So guns are illegal there. So someone decided to get one to shoot a cat? Apparently. And not either, even kill it? Well, you know, the aim, if it's a country where there are no guns, and probably the aim is suspect at that point. Not a lot of practice. But are they trying to get the cat? Why are they mad at the cat? Or are they trying to get Jordan through the cat? Or cats, as the case may be. What do you think? They're going to poison the cat, but the cat will bring the poison into the house? Well, or just to torment Jordan. And this is a 10-year-long program. What could Jordan do to booby trap or sabotage the plans of uh, the neighbor with the pigeons? You know what? You know that liquid, lick, liquid. The liquid? Lic which one? The, shut up now. The liquid <laughs> nitroglycerin that you always see on the wild, wild west. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, the, what he needs to do is take and pour the liquid nitroglycerin in the cat's water bowl or milk bowl, as the case may be. And then the cat will drink the nitroglycerin. And then when the fat bastard with the pigeons on the other side of the fence tries to fuck with the cat, the cat will explode, killing the pigeon man. I don't know if that's the best idea for this. Well, show me what's wrong with it. First of all, wouldn't, the cat would die as soon as it starts ingesting the material. No, no, it would. The milk would soften it. It kind of like you know, milk takes the burn out of pepper spray. It's not kind of like that at all. It's nothing like that in any way. <laughs> if you dilute it with the milk, <laughs> then <laughs> then the cat wouldn't blow up. It would. It on its own. It would have to be shaken or uh, tormented in some way. Beyond the. If you shot it, it'd blow up. Well, beyond the exploding uh, ability. Would it have any other new skills or anything with its new ingestion? What? No. What, what do you think this is, gamma radiation? No. If a cat drinks nitroglycerin, you'd have to be an idiot to think that it would gain any other powers besides the power to explode. All right. And you learned this on Wild Wild West, right? Yes. Okay. <sighs> The, ep the episode with Victor Bueno. You know what was on the other day? We're talking old TV now. It's always weird to see it. The episodes of Mannix that take place, however you want to put it, on the set of or in the house of the Brady Bunch. So here's Mannix doing his thing, and they're in the Brady Bunch house. Is that, is that the first season when he was working for Joseph Campanella's private security firm before they changed the plot device and made him go out on his own as an independent private dick? I think it was actually a later season. Oh. And I could be wrong. See, there are a lot of changes there. He went from, from working for Joseph Campanella for a, for a security firm. He went all the way to living in the Brady Bunch's house and bonking Carol Brady when Mike was out of town. Well, Mike really didn't care anyway, though. Yeah. Mike, Mike wanted yeah. to watch. Yeah. I'll tell you, you know, that the thing is, how did Mike <laughs> have the three sons that joined together with Carol's three girls with with him playing for the other team all along, as we found out later on in the 80s. We found out that the real person was a homosexual, but the character of Mike Brady was classically heterosexual. Oh, classically. Classically. He had three kids, and he married this woman, and they weren't going to have more. I guess he had a vasectomy, too, now that I think about it. Well, you know, because we've already proven that both of them could fucking go. Yeah. So I'm I'm wondering why they didn't have that should have been a thing after four or five seasons they had they could have had their own. I don't care how many kids you had. If you're like 40 years old and married to Florence Henderson, she seemed like she was a a fun woman. So now we know what the fuck was going on with you and the Brady Bunch. Or Mannix and the Brady Bunch. Seriously, have you ever seen those episodes of Men? They're in the Brady Bunch no, house. It's weird. You're it's really just weird to see into it. a vacuum now. Nobody believes this. You're you're. It's it's the drugs you're on is causing you to see Mannix in the Brady. It was he was coming to date Alice? 
And what was Alice's relationship in that whole picture there? That's what we'd like to know. You're going to see, someone's going to send you now Mannix and other people on the set of the Brady Bunch. It's really weird. Like, <laughs> you got to see it. <laughs> I can't tell if you really don't believe me that it took place or if you know about it already. No, I believe you. I just don't believe that you're this fucking thrilled by it. Well, it was two in the morning. Maddox is up pretty two, late. It was two in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> it's, TV. it's a quarter to three. There's no one in the place except Joe Maddox and me. Uh, was that Reggie's corner? Are we done? That was Reggie's corner. <laughs> Reggie's Corner. We're here to talk about your good boys and girls. Reggie's Corner. We're so sorry they're dead now. Mannix. Oh, for heaven's sake. All right. R real briefly, uh, speaking of real dogs, Hotchkiss Featherbottom is, is working as hard as he can to fill all the orders at jimcornet.com. And there have been so many of them because, of course, my. Jim Cornette face t-shirt is taking on international proportions. It's seen around the world on weekly live television now, so there has been a lot of demand, but you can order with impunity, folks, because the feather bottoms are on the case. Action figures, t-shirts, books, DVDs, Cult of Cornette membership certificates, and so much more available right now at jimcornette.com. Once again, that's jimcornette.com, Cornette's collectibles for the finest in pro wrestling merchandise, as well as if you just love me and you hate wrestling, you'll still be happy when you go there. See, so that covers a wider variety. Of, the people that love me and hate wrestling now have, have eclipsed the people that just like wrestling now. Hey, real quick, Jim, uh, for people who have the Cult of Cornette certificate, if you either tweet or email to the Corny drive through email address a photo of your certificate and you're trying to get into the Cult of Cornet Facebook group, send us a photo. We'll try to get you in if you're already a certificate holder. Well, there you go. Yeah, because that should be like the TSA, you know, uh, skip the line check-in thing for the frequent travelers. Now, if you act like a knucklehead, we'll throw you right the fuck out. I don't care what certificate you have. Well, that's like the TSA also. But if you have a certificate... Like the TSA, send us a copy of yeah. it and we'll see if we can verify you. Yeah, if you act like a knucklehead, they'll still kick you the fuck out. You know, I just realized we started talking earlier about the weak link in our chain that we were in the process of replacing and stories were coming up, but we didn't tell the people what the schedule is going to be like on the programming this week. That's what we skipped over, which was the whole point of when I started going into that and we both got sidetracked. So should we tell the people what we're doing this week? I could start the wood chipper up again. It's up to you. Well, I just uh, without going to any trouble, how about this? Folks, this is the Jim Cornette experience, and we're going to talk about everything you're going to hear us talk about today on the program. And then the AEW Forbidden Door pay-per-view, which is going to take place on Sunday night, tonight as we are speaking now, and probably Monday morning and into Monday afternoon. We are going to come back as quickly as possible on, say, Tuesday evening-ish or so with a clip reviewing that pay-per-view or clips on the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. And the drive through this week will be an omnibus of the funniest moments of the year, volume Two. No, not of the year, of all time. Not of the of all time, even more than the year. So it's like world and universe. Funniest moments of all time, volume two, because of the various personal schedules that myself and Brian Last and we understand J Shark NATO apparently the four days community service lands at the, the end of this week. So he's out of pocket for a little while in the editing process and we're switching some things around so that's going to be the schedule so if if you haven't subscribed to the official jim Cornette youtube channel and you want to hear the forbidden door review this week that's where it's going to end up because we don't have another show coming out until next week's experience did i 
summarize that correctly? You did. And just for the record, this week's drive through, like you said, in the drive through feed will be an omnibus, but drive through episode 300 will be next week. That's right. Because we weren't just going to just skip over the milestone there. Because I'm still holding out hope for cake. From who? You can get yourself a cake anytime Anybody, you want. Anybody, you know, people, a number of people have sent me cakes on occasion. Suckers. They've sent some of those too. <laughs> but mostly cake. <laughs> cake is more substantial. The suckers uh, don't really quell your appetite. I guess not. I guess not. All right. Real quickly, before we talk, and we're going to talk about last week's uh, Dark Side of the Ring, or last Tuesday's. Hadn't even been a week ago. Dark Side of the Ring uh, episode in a second. But just real briefly, I just wanted to make mention of this. Not a huge topic. But did you see the NXT ratings this past Tuesday night for Seth Rollins and Braun Breaker? I did. Over 800,000 viewers for the overall uh, show number, which now is up to, again... You know, that's what they're doing over at AEW for their flagship program. This is the third brand. And they topped 900,000 for the main event with Seth Franklin and our, our boy Braun, which is more than the flagship program on Wednesday nights for AEW gets on most, in most quarters on most Wednesday nights. And uh, besides the fact that that's a big jump for one match, but, you know, obviously people know that uh, not only is, is Seth a, a star, but Braun is a guy for the future. They were getting a sneak preview of what the main roster is going to look like in a couple of years. And uh, so that was a big match. But also at this point, you know... It, they were overjoyed when AEW debuted and up against a head-to-head -head NXT and that they were winning that war again over the third brand. But it was, in those days, it was like a million to 600,000, as I recall, wasn't it? On, you know, 900 to a million that they were doing at that point and 600, 650,000 for NXT. NXT is now doing bigger numbers than their flagship program does. I know they're not head to head, but combine that with the numbers the Bloodline is doing, they're getting a bunch of people that hadn't watched wrestling in a while to come back and watch this shit. And that is the opposite of what AEW is doing. They're getting people who've been watching wrestling to stop watching it. Or am I just imagining that? Uh, I mean, it is what it is. <sighs> anyway, you want to talk about the dark side of the ring? It's quite the episode this week. Yes, the title of the episode, I believe, was Whatever Happened to Doink the Clown, but it was about Matt Bourne, the dark side of the ring last week, and in the words of Gorilla Monsoon, what a piece of work. And here that you and I were talking uh, before the show aired, the only time that our my path ever crossed with Matt Bournes was, did we figure out two television tapings when I entered the WWF in 1993 with the Heavenly Bodies? He was there like that taping and the next taping uh, before he got fired as Doink the Clown. And, and SummerSlam. Uh, well, yeah, well, but that that's what I'm... The, we went in one taping ahead of the SummerSlam set of tapings. So he worked with me, those tapings we did. And then that was back in the days we did once a month. So you would do the pay-per-view on Sunday and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And the, so it was the two sets of tapings is what I'm trying to say. Don't complicate things, Brian. You know, I'm not right. <laughs> and Bob Eaton, you say it all the time. I'd, I'd cross him up with something he'd said. <laughs> Corny, don't do that to me. You know I'm not right. Calling but about anyway, a plane ride. Talking about a plane ride now, but the only time that I was ever around a guy, and then I don't remember, I'm sure we said hello, you know, at, at some point passed in the hall, but we had no interaction. We, we had just got there doing a completely different thing. He was doink. 
And that's the first time I heard the famous De Clown is Down story when they were debuting the the doink gimmick originally they didn't know the clown was going to be evil remember he came out and just entertained kids and didn't do anything off kilter you saw him in the stands yeah he's just in the stands and what the fuck is that clown doing up there well they're in philadelphia one night and they're having what it's one of those five hour long my god nobody's learned in 40 years the tv tapings the wwf used to do with squash matches and blah 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 and they've got a production delay on top of that, and they send the clown out to do his thing in the stands while they're trying to get their tape re-racked or whatever. And the people were so fucking disgruntled and surly, and it was Philadelphia anyway. They they got they mobbed Doink and took him down, knocked him, pushed him down while he was trying to you know walk up the stairs in the general admission seats or whatever. And Tony Gurria's on the headset at the gorilla position. He in his, his accent. No, it was Rene Goulet. Is Rene Goulet with his French accent, and he was reporting to the truck. The clown is down. The clown is down. But anyway, apparently this clown was down for most of his life, and I'd heard the stories of what he had the various trouble he'd gotten into in different territories when he would get, because when we went to mid South, they were still talking about Matt Bourne getting him sued and, you know, getting fired from mid South. And then when we went to, uh, well, when I went to, uh, Georgia in the summer of 83 with the guys from Tennessee to do the local shows that were booked by Bill Dundee, we've told those stories. Yeah. Georgia. That's, I've heard of Georgia. Yeah. I wonder why they didn't mention Georgia at all in the Matt Bourne thing. I've heard well, there, of... there wasn't time. <laughs> there, there was his fucking rap sheet was gone over. The, he was out of mainstream wrestling halfway through this program and still getting arrested and shit. So they just, they, they didn't have time. But when we got there, that's where the road warriors had just been brought down and just debuted on Atlanta TV because the original heel team that Ole was going to go with was Arn Anderson and Matt Bourne and Matt Bourne got in trouble and you know had to leave the territory quickly and so he had to bring in the Road Warriors just go hey Eddie Sharkey you got anybody I got nobody I mean, that's a big thing to leave out though the trouble Matt Bourne got into which I always heard was with a young girl but I don't know well that's what I was hearing about two months after it supposedly happened the trouble he got into led to the creation of the Road Warriors. Yes. I mean, that's a pretty significant role in history. I mean, that kind of thing has to be mentioned, I think. There's well, no Legion of Doom. There's no Road Warriors without Matt Bourne being a derelict. And I forgot that some people may not have known that also, to be honest with you, because it was just so known at the time. But, uh, you know, that's... <laughs> they had They had good talking heads on this one. In terms of, again, the daughter of one of these talents ends up being the most sympathetic person. And Mick Foley was on because he spent time in Texas with Matt Bourne. Um, Dr. Tom Pritchard is always good on these. He's got a good way of analyzing people in the wrestling business. He's fantastic on these. Yeah. And because he's seen all these guys and make all these mistakes and made some of them himself. And he can speak from experience and he's, he's honest. a great coach. Yeah. And he's honest. He, it's because he's honest. And he also understands the complexities of the kind of people that are in wrestling, but he understands the reality of everyday society. He's great in these. And he's the best coach in wrestling. Cause he's honest. That's why he doesn't have a mainstream job. Cause he's honest. But anyway, and hacksaw Duggan. So we got that, um, Duggan, DiBiase, and Matt Bourne as the Rat Pack in Louisiana were pretty much the, would you say, the 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 best heel faction in between the Freebirds and the, and the Midnight coming in, in terms of, you know, Mid-South's talent roster. I think at that 82-83 period, I mean, D Duggan was green, Bourne could work his ass off, and DiBiase was DiBiase, but Duggan had the muscle. He was like the the Gordy of that group at that time. Well, the thing is, there weren't a lot of factions. This is right when you start getting factions, right when, you know, 
All of a sudden, Continental starts doing things a little bit after this period of time. And the Freebirds, of course, have been out there. Well, then the Freebirds were a three-man team. The Rat Pack was three individuals. The Midnight and I were a tag team and manager, but it was three people together on the heel side that that were also, you know, could hold their own in the ring. You know, and remember, Matt Bourne was never in Mid-South, and then at the end of 82, they do the big episode where the gorilla in the crowd interferes in the match where JYD loses and has to leave town. The tag team is Ted DiBiase and Matt Bourne. That was Matt Bourne's debut. He was replacing Jim Duggan, who no one knew where he was, and of course he was a gorilla interfering, and that was the formation (laughs) of the Rat Pack right there. He was really good. I mean, that's the thing. You see the things he's doing in the ring. He was good, but he was also spectacular. That it later became the whoopee cushion. The bombs away. Yeah. Looked incredible. And I know his dad did it, but that's one thing he was able to do always. And it always looked good. But the Rat Pack had a relatively short run. And Duggan came into his own very quickly. Matt Bourne was good, but... He was almost like the third, he was almost like the Buddy Roberts, but without the on-screen personality of Buddy Roberts. <laughs> well, and and that's the thing with with Bourne, he was a great worker, but as as this episode, you know, illustrated, he was his own worst enemy, and you couldn't really, you know, build anything around him or trust him because he was so erratic. And I don't know how he managed to work Mid-South as a heel without going to prison with that, you know, anger management issue and then being that, you know, fucking over the top. Because, uh, again, the reason why, you heard Duggan tell the story, the reason why that Bourne got fired was the guy hit Duggan. Duggan hit him back. And when Duggan hit somebody, they were immediately went down. But then Bourne had to fucking kick the guy's face in uh, you know, while he was already down, and that's what got the lawsuit, right? And the cops were already, you know, trying to get the guy at that point. But I don't think he, I don't think he kicked his eyeball out, as the story indicated. But what he did was same thing Stan Lane did to that guy in Beckley. He fractured his orbital socket, and they, they, they like measure the the millimeters or centimeters, one of those things that your eyeball is displaced, whether it's too far back or far out or whatever the case. But still, that's not a pleasant thing to go through. But how Bourne could be in that environment with that personality and not go to prison is amazing to me or or get in trouble even worse than he did. Because think of the, the fan interaction in that territory we've talked about But not only that, he's going out to bars. He's going out drinking. In that territory, if you were on television, on Mid-South TV, everybody knew who you were. And when, you know, guys went out, especially the heels, they had trouble more often than not. And that's why a lot of those guys wanted to go out just to prove that, you know, they were who they said they were. But in the territory at the same time, you had Jim Duggan, who played pro football as six foot three, two eighty, and all these guys are young, not the guys you saw on TV or you see now at the Legends Fan Fest. They're in their fucking twenties, and they're on steroids, and and it's the eighties, so everybody thinks they have to do cocaine. And Butch Reed, who played football, was a badass. Barry Darso bounced at the same place the Road Warriors did with six feet fucking three and 300 pounds. Hercules Hernandez that I have saw, witnessed, hospitalize a guy with an open-handed slap. And Dr. Death Steve Williams, for fuck's sake. And Nikolai Volkov, even though he was older, he was 6'3 and 320 and, and was a pro boxer at one point. And Jim Neidhart, the fucking anvil. All those guys in that in the dressing room at the same time, and the fans are attacking them. (laughs) That's what I'm saying. That's why we almost got killed. (laughs) But no, it was not uncommon to for fans or wrestlers to come back from the fucking ring after matches, black eyes, bloody lips, butt head busted open, 
it, it, sometimes the fans got more juice at the shows than the wrestlers did because the cops had the nightsticks. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 go ahead. Yeah, nothing about the Georgia stuff, which I think is important because, A, he gets in trouble with a young girl, allegedly, as far as I know, and the Road Warriors creation. Not much about the stuff in Portland with him and Buddy Rose. Buddy Rose married his sister. And wasn't there like a real life series of yes. incidents? Well, they covered that in the Buddy story, didn't they? I remember seeing whatever the case. But yes, uh, Bourne was going to kill Buddy Rose at one point for marrying his sister for real to further a fucking wrestling angle. I'm not even sure. I don't know whether the girl was in on it or whether she thought that they were really going to spend their life together full of happiness. But anyway, I don't believe the Brian Blair story of biting Bourne's lip off. I know Brian Blair was a, a very high level amateur wrestler, but I think if Bourne was a jacked up on many, as many drugs as he said he was and had three tries at him and, uh, and, and Blair had bit his lip off that we would have heard more about that. Don't you think? I will say, I've heard Brian Blair tell this story before, and I could be wrong, and I'm not thinking of a specific name. I think I've heard from someone, I think it was someone who was in the bar, one of the boys who confirmed it. Really? At least the severity of the fight, the lip-spitting thing, I would have to double-check. <laughs> yeah, okay. But, the, you know, like, the okay, Brian Blair we, kicked we the shit out of Matt Bourne has never been in dispute. We know that Mario Galento hit the ring on Jerry Jarrett. We don't know for sure that Jerry actually pulled his eyeball out and stomped on it on the mat. So we, we do know that Brian Blair kicked the shit out of Matt Bourne, but we're not sure about biting the lip off and spitting it out. Right. Okay. Anyway, basically this, this was not really a, a wrestling documentary. It was a documentary about this prick that happened to be a wrestler for some period of, of time and was a second generation wrestler, obviously tough Tony Bourne, who was a uh, Northwest legend was his dad, but he worked the territories, got fired from most of them, had several ex wives. I'm not sure that either of them were particularly sympathetic. One of them said the, uh, I married him cause I loved him. All of his other wives married him for his money. What money? The fuck? We're not talking about goddamn, you know, fucking Mark Cuban here, are we? But anyway, beside, like I said, besides the daughter, the the they had a couple of the ex-wives. Uh, one of them said that Matt Bourne went out the night before she gave birth and never came home, and he showed up drunk when the baby was born. And they got to the the Doink the Clown gimmick. And again, briefly on that, because he, he made the gimmick, but he lost the job because he was on drugs. His wife left him. He kept disappearing. He got abusive. He, he stayed up eight days straight doing cocaine, whatever. And, and the thing is, except for the fact that the clown wasn't as entertaining as he was before, the fans really didn't know when... Steve Kern stepped in for a minute just because they fired him on, sh fired uh, uh, Bourne on short notice. But then they got Ray Apollo, who actually, uh, Steve Kern, I think, could have given a shit about being Doink the Clown, but he did it because they were paying him. But Apollo actually worked on it and worked hard at it. But most people did not know outside the limited amount of smart fans at the time, did they? Or am I overstating that? Smart fans knew. The casual fan didn't know. I never, you know, I was going to arena shows still in like 90. I was going when they changed doinks and I never heard any fans complain. That's a different doink. Hey, there, that's a bait and switch. We want the good doink. It's amazing. Uh. You know, if you go back to the earlier stuff, gets fired in 83 from Mid-South. Gets fired in 83 from Georgia. Actually, same year. For the reasons he got fired, it's amazing he ended up going to work for Vince and ended up on WrestleMania. Of all the guys they could have used on that card, they had so many guys not on WrestleMania. Yeah. They picked Matt Bourne to lose to Ricky Steamboat. And I wonder, you know, at, at that point, you know what? George Scott, Tony Bourne, same era. Maybe it was a favor. Because Vince was... 
that early in the expansion, he had grabbed so many guys. He didn't know half who those people were. And he was relying on, as he usually, as he still does, and as he usually has, you know, his, whoever he was listening to, to recommend people. So I guarantee you, he'd probably never heard that Matt Bourne existed until somebody brought him up and probably didn't do too much checking. They mentioned ECW. I will say that is one of the great missed opportunities because in 94, he showed up as Doink and he became born again with half his face painted and looked crazy, had his real hair out. And it was nuts. And his promos were crazy, but good. And it was Heyman. And Heyman was getting ready to really go nuts with ECW. He couldn't even last there. That locker room was <laughs> completely insane. He couldn't last there. He was gone. If he lasted two tapings, maybe, but it was a fascinating character, what that could have been. Well, and uh, he they went over some of his other arrests. He was in a bar with his second ex-wife and her ex-boyfriend. She said, spit on her for some reason. That was the quote. So this guy just apparently walks up and just spits on his woman. She had apparently made a big impression on him. And Bourne gets arrested for chasing him outside and lifting the guy's car. Yeah. Um, he put his... Uh, there's that same ex-wife in the hospital beat her up and put her in the hospital and went to jail for it. And the next day she said he didn't remember doing it. So she forgave him again. The, there was all the sympathy fell squarely on the daughter in this episode. And finally she left with her kids. And then they talked about the, the match with Duggan that I I had forgotten about until, because it was 2010, I guess, and I'd forgotten about it until somebody a couple of years ago had a clip on Twitter, and it, it was not like this knockdown, drag-out fight. It was just, again, Matt Bourne being a dick because apparently Jim Duggan didn't want to, you know, do chairs and two-befores in front of 100 people at some spot show because I'd never heard Duggan's explanation of it, but he said that Bourne came up and said, hey, I'll hit you with a chair and you hit me with a two before. And he's like, brother, there's a hundred people here. And even then, Duggan was a cancer survivor. And this wasn't 1983, it was 2010. He said, look, I'll salute the flag and got the promo and, you know, and we'll do our thing. And so as soon as they get started, Bourne's not cooperating, tried to hit him in the balls for a shoot. And they just have a goddamn argument in the ring. And Duggan's like, you want to work or shoot? And Bourne goes out and gets a chair. So Duggan gets his two before and tells the referee. And I love this line, Brian. He tells the referee, he said, tell him we'll finish it in the back like we're supposed to. <laughs> If Bill Watts was in charge, I guess. Yes, but, and then Bourne leaves through the front door and gets in his car and drives off without ever coming to the back. Like he's supposed to. Like he's supposed to. And Mick Foley was laughing about, this is so true. He's dying laughing about how you would have to try as hard as possible to dislike Jim Duggan. Nobody dislikes Jim Duggan. But yet this fucking clown, clown! legitimately wants to fucking shoot with him when they're in their fucking fifties over something that had happened 30 years before that. But okay. Then tell me, Brian, you're a savant. You, your wrestling history. Who the fuck was nurse Cratchit? Do you, did you even remember a nurse Cratchit in Memphis wrestling? I do, because I remember some of the oddball characters. She managed Dr. Death. <laughs> Not Steve Williams. Not Steve Williams, but Dr. Death managed by, he's a doctor, by Nurse Cratchit. Not Nurse Ugh. Ratchet, but Nurse Cratchit. So this then becomes another country heard from, as they say, the last girlfriend of Matt Bourne, Connie Cook, who apparently had been for a brief period, a brief, a brief period of time, Nurse Cratchit in Memphis and who currently looks for all the world like a fucking frog 
is wearing a blonde wig instead of the princess kissing the prince and turning into a frog or whatever the some evolution has gone backwards with this woman wherever that kiss it's supposed to turn the frog into what are you what are you talking about with the frogs the frog and the prince it is that the prince kisses the frog and the frog turns into a princess or is the princess kisses the prince and the prince or the frog and the frog turns into a prince God damn, now you got me confused. I thought it was See? a princess kisses the frog and he turns into a prince. There you go. Well, some way or another, a prince kissed this fucking woman and she turned into a frog. That's not how that goes. Wait, you just well, it, it, that's what I'm saying. It, they changed it just for this woman. Because she's sitting there with her frog fucking face. <laughs> and her goddamn story is, well, I met him... When I was in wrestling, nurse, and she couldn't even pronounce the name. She said, I was Nurse Cratchert. I hit people with my bedpan. And she said, he was crazy and I was crazy, so we hit it off. So apparently he's got, he's a fucking drug-addled, jobless bum, and he finds this frog on Facebook, and he becomes her prince, and they get together long enough for her to be suspected of murdering him. I would have to go back and check, but I don't, and I could be wrong. I could be very, very wrong. I don't remember him in the USWA when she was there. Would it have been during the Dallas, uh, tennis, uh, the, the Dallas and world-class and USWA crossover period? Cause he spent a lot of time in Texas when he was out of mainstream wrestling i have to go back and check but i do love the fact that it happened on facebook like hey it's me it's matt Bourne. how you doing you have a place to live yeah how you doing <laughs> have you got a house are you still a nurse are you still a nurse can you write prescriptions i'll be there you have good benefits don't you so apparently not only do his daughter and one of his exes think that she killed him but he also allegedly told her his ex, if anything happens to me, well, it's Connie. She killed me, basically. And Connie, old nurse Ratchet, thinks that Matt Bourne took her dying mother's drugs because she was apparently on hospice, her dying mother. Well, the, so here's this drunken drug addict and this fucking frog who knows what she's on. You can get warts from that shit. And this frog's dying, cancer-ridden mother in hospice with drugs in the house. What a fucking family circle that was. And people found Matt Bourne out in the yard on the ground and steered him back into their home where she put him to bed and... He was snoring and or gurgling all night, so she thought he was okay. But then, when she got up about 6.30 in the morning and saw him gurgling and foaming at the mouth, she called it... Obviously, Brian, what's the first thing you do when somebody that you suspect of taking cancer-strength medication uh, is now gurgling and foaming at the mouth, you've got to call your best friend in Tennessee to get some advice, right? You'd call me, wouldn't you? You're not in Tennessee anymore. Well, but I'm, I'm it's the same thing, New Jersey to Kentucky. This was fucking Texas to Tennessee or wherever. Yeah, okay, I'll call you. Call me, I'll give you the straight scoop. Well, apparently the friend that she called said, yeah, it sounds like he's dying to me. So she says that she hung up and called 911, but there's this pesky problem that all the 911 calls are time-stamped. And while she claims, and, and this is not disputed in the episode, that she talked to this friend who said, yeah, he's fucking dying. At 6.30 in the morning, she called 911, we're all around about to crack at 9 a.m. But she said, no, I didn't go back to bed. I did not do that. I called right away. Yeah, but the timestamp on the thing is talk to 630. Yeah, and it. So he overdosed and also had a giant enlarged heart. And apparently if Connie didn't kill him, she certainly didn't go out of her way in any respect to prevent his 
imminent demise. Well, we'll talk about crazy tag teams. How about in World Class in 86, Buzz Sawyer and Matt Bourne? Oh, Jesus Christ. And uh, again, it, it, you could actually, you could put pretty much put Buzz Sawyer's head on Matt Bourne's body or vice versa and almost have the same person. So anyway, I think except for the daughter, all of these people deserved each other. And Mick Foley actually did a nice eulogy at the end for a guy that was such a dick, but it was good to see that the daughter has done well for herself and she's an accountant now or something. And Yeah, that's exactly what she is. Life. She's a CPA. She's an yes. accountant. CPA. Well, there you go. Seems like she has her shit together. Good for her. Mick Foley could say anything. He just smiles. Yeah, Mick. Mick can find something good to say about <laughs> anybody. He can find the the one brief little moment when a disreputable, repugnant human being actually exhibited some kind of human qualities, and he'll focus on that. He's a very wonderful, wonderful person, Mick Foley. But that was Matt Bourne. Final thoughts on Matt Bourne. Again, I think there were things left out of the documentary that needed to be there. There was no reason not to have him there. We didn't need a reenactment of the Brian Blair fight thing, and we didn't need a multiple. How many times did we see the eyeball pop out of that guy's head? Was well, it was a, it was a times. bumper going to the break. You, you don't you don't want you don't want to leave the television when you know there's going to be eyeballs popping and flying. Eh, I don't know. That's not a proven thing. But um, beyond you that, know, if if Nielsen starts to measure that, then I I'm going to put fifty dollars on it that if you see a tease of an eyeball being popped out of a fucking head before the commercial break, you'll hang around to see what happens. Well, Game of Thrones didn't have commercials, so I don't know. But in terms of Matt Bourne, crazy fucking guy, really good as a wrestler. I mean, there's something to be yeah. said for that. There was a for a long time the crazy. Human beings that you wouldn't want to deal with in the everyday world were great professional wrestlers, but too crazy for even wrestling. Couldn't hold the job anywhere, even at home. And, um, you know, doing that. Couldn't was, hold a job at home? You might want to work on that one. I mean, like in Portland. You know, he couldn't even oh, hold a job. I thought you meant, well, he couldn't hold a fucking home at home, though. You know, doing the clown for something that was something that should have been awful in an era where people who hated WWF pointed to it and talked about it being a circus. They created a clown. And like you said, it wasn't evil right away. He was great in that role. He played that role perfectly. He made it work. And then he could actually wrestle in the ring. I mean, you could go watch raw from the first six months of 93. He was tremendous. Oh yeah. Him and Randy Savage. I think he did something with him and Janetti. They were just these great matches because Matt Bourne was fantastic in the ring. And that run, which again would have kept going, ended for him less than a year after it started. Well, and it's funny because they did reveal that Road Warrior Hawk was the one that named it because he looked so much like Krusty the Clown after a match when he was just all disheveled and whatever. Um... And because of his impact on the Road Warriors actually being a team to begin with. So he, well, he didn't name him necessarily, but he, he called it. He said, yeah, he looks like Krusty the Clown. We got our own Krusty right here. If all the things that Matt Borden got in trouble with, everything that happened in his life happened 20, 25 years later, would he even be able to get a job in wrestling? You know, the, oh, fact, good that, Lord. the no. fact that he got to work for the WWF in 85 is one thing, because they were still just hiring everyone and the world was what it was. But even to go back after Big Josh in 92 to be doink, would that have happened 10 years later, 15 years later or now? No, because, again, not only did most fans not know what happened in any other territory or when, it, you know, remember when they brought Art Barr to WCW? Yeah. Um, that was 19, what, 90. It was only the, the smart fan, the limited pool of smart fans at that time that knew anything about it, that brought it to the attention of WCW and Jim Hurd cost him his job there. And that was not, it wasn't that it, when confronted with the news, Hey, this guy abuses his wife or he's been convicted of doing something with an underage person or whatever. It wasn't that 
it was ignored completely as that it wasn't known. There wasn't the internet. There wasn't, unless literally the wrestling fans were sending each other clippings out of the newspaper from Monroe, Louisiana to wherever the fuck. And the same thing with Vince, like you said, not only is he hiring all these guys from all these territories that are in the business, he didn't, he didn't see any more of them years ago than we've talked about. He saw in modern times, he went by, you know, uh, Pat Patterson or George Scott or Jim Ross or whoever is booking or creative staff was at the time recommendations. And a lot of times you didn't know what, there was no background checks because they weren't in those in the eighties. They weren't signing long-term contracts with every Tom, Dick and Harry, but also there was no database to go by. So, you know, and there was no, um, there was no way that any wrestling fans were going to know widespread background information on people's criminal records or whatever. Hey, so listen, it was a whole different time. Jimmy Snuka murdered his girlfriend in 83 in the middle of his run. And, it well, and, and that now that one, Vince definitely knew what was going on there. But in that case, it was his biggest star. But I'm talking about in terms of fans and fan knowledge of things and fans caring about things. Cause there were some fans who knew cause things got into the newspaper. Apparently there were fans briefly chanting murderer at him. Yeah. But only in the Northeast and only at a couple of TV tapings. And then nobody, nobody really got it. But Snooker was fired for flaming out on drugs, not for that stuff. And then he was brought back in 89 and then he made guest appearances all throughout time until his scandal, well, until, until his scandal, until, it got reinvestigated what happened in 83. Oh, yeah. But because, because Snuka was Snuka and Matt Bourne was Matt Bourne. If Matt Bourne had gotten over to the level of Jimmy Snuka before all that shit came out, it would have been a different story. He, but he, he got, he, all of Bourne's shortcomings came to light either while he was working there or, you know, whatever, before he ever really got over to the point that they couldn't do without him. He never he never got a chance to get established before he got fired for something. Well, there it is. Another talented <laughs> yet unemployable crazy person from the world of wrestling. Matt and Borden. speaking speaking of people who got established before they could get fired for doing shit, this coming week it's the Junkyard Dog. On Dark Side of the Ring Vice TV Tuesday nights at 10 Eastern. So at that point, Dog could have gotten away with almost anything except the one thing that he did do, which was take off and leave with no notice. Anyway, speaking of no notice, would you like to just jump right into this past week's SmackDown? This can't be too long, right? This can't be. Of course not, because it basically as the bloodline turns with matches in between. But again, it's working. They're doing monster numbers just... Uh, it, just for the for people to know, I guess, as soon as they can, they don't want it spoiled later on or they don't want somebody to know before them who's on whose side and what's going to happen next in the bloodline. Is there anything else going on here on this program that you can point to to explain why their numbers are up in the hundreds of thousands of viewers per week from what they were just a few months ago? People care about the storylines. That's why. But then there's only one storyline. They care about the one storyline. <laughs> I mean, there are people getting over it. I mean, you can't, the LA night thing is getting bigger by the week. But beyond that, it's the one storyline that they, you laid it out perfectly, I think last week, act one, act two, act three, act yep. four, and then you get the big crescendo. And that's what's happening. Well, on the crescendo this week, they opened up SmackDown for June 23rd with a VTR package of the Bloodline blow-up last week and the Usos kicking Roman on his ass. And then here come the Usos. And they get a big pop. And they're over now more. This has worked. They're over now more than I think they have been that I've been seeing. They're chanting Uso, and they're, they've got the Uso signs. And everybody's feeling Usy. The only thing that didn't feel oozy was this promo to me. Before I go into detail, did you seem that 
This meandered around and people liked it, but it beat around a lot of bush. I mean, it wasn't direct and to the point. It would have been 10 seconds if it was that. <laughs> I guess they didn't they know what to talk about. I mean, I don't think they were in the ring until what? I don't think they were in the ring with the mics until seven minutes in, eight minutes in. Probably. So, I mean, it took them a while just to get to the ring. But the package was at, at the start also, so that got us hooked. But they are... Jimmy and Jay, to me, when they're doing live promos and they pause to let the fans react, they don't they don't pause and let the fans react in a way that like a Cody does or a Punk does. It kind of looks like when they pause and let the fans react that they just kind of forgot what they were going to say and they just want the fans there. They just, that, it's an abrupt shutoff. And... They're trying to go back and forth, you know, with some of the the verbiage, but the the thing was, ba they're about to fight their family, and they're not supposed to do that, because family's supposed to take up for each other, but we got to do this now, because Roman didn't take up for us, but we still love Roman, but he messed up by disrespecting us. They fired up at the end. You know, and talking about they can always forgive Roman because he's family, but they can't forgive Haman. And at some point, that'll play into something. But I, I thought this meandered and beat around a lot of bush, even though they, they finished strong on the tag team match this weekend. They didn't have a lot to say that was revelatory or needed relating that we didn't already know up until they got to that point where 15 minutes in the program. You know, this is one of those weeks where there's no Roman. And those are different weeks than the ones where you have him. I'm not even saying him wrestling, just him appearing on the show. So it's almost like a step back and a stall week. Let's progress some things, but not everything. And wouldn't it be funny if Heyman accuses them of being anti-Semitic? <laughs> That's why these guys don't like me. No, um, you know, this really... Because he could be, uh, he could be painted as a rabid anti-Samoanite. Well, there you go. This was a fine opening. You knew there was going to be something more later, and if you watched the show, you knew it would probably be at the last segment. So it was fine. It established something will happen at the end. They're mad at Solo. Well, at least we know who they're mad at. And Heyman. Now they really hate Heyman. You know, but now they used to win, like every once in a while. I remember when I was a young man, when I was just a young lad, my father would never miss an episode of Gunsmoke on CBS television. And every once in a while, Matt Dillon would leave town. Marshall Dillon would leave town and all kinds of shit would happen while he was gone. He'd be negotiating his contract. Well, he, he would be off on a <laughs> hunting a desperate, desperate fugitive. But shit would happen while he was gone. And then somehow Festus or Newly or Doc or Kitty or Sam or all of those people would all get together and mostly solve the thing But by the time that he got back. So Roman doesn't have to be there every week. But you know, Isn't it, it amazing that Heyman managing the Samoan SWAT team in 89 <laughs> is a part of the biggest angle in professional wrestling in years? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's good. It, it certainly wasn't part of the biggest angle in wrestling in 1989. I'll tell you that. What, the Marietta Massacre? That wasn't the biggest angle of 89? <laughs> mm. Anyway, but moving on in SmackDown, LA Knight versus Rey Mysterio. And I thought, oh my God, they're going to beat the shit out of LA Knight again. And we know how that's been going, but he continues to get a big reaction. And so I watched this match, and Ray is a genius in that almost exclusively now, the heels open up strong on him so he can fight from underneath. And then he'll give them a tease, he'll give them a move and a tease of another move, but they'll shut him down. So he gives the fans a little bit at a time, but he's always fighting from underneath. And then finally, when he makes his big comeback, you know, it, it's it's brilliant because he's smaller, he's older, he's a legend, but he's got the trademark moves and he knows how to put it together. It's brilliant. And he's still got new shit, like the baseball slide splash out on the floor, which is, I guess, technically safer and 
less wear and tear on your body than a fucking dive, but since nobody else does it, it looked great, whereas everybody's doing these dives. But anyway, a, a good match. Both guys are pros. Everything was right there in place. L.A. Knight, like I said, was in control most of the match, but Ray would have hope spots and fire up and then made the final big comeback. Beautiful high cross body. Um, they got a this is awesome chant lightly from the crowd. And they went back and forth with a couple of two counts. And then Ray goes for the 619. L.A. Knight foils it by grabbing him. And they jockey back and forth, and L.A. Knight traps him and gives him his finish. Boom, one, two, three. And I was like, wow. L.A. Knight has gone from not being able to beat Howie the mailroom guy to just beating Rey Mysterio with his finish, one, two, three. So maybe somebody has realized something. This is one of those cases the fans are reacting to someone who just happens to be really, really good at what he's doing. I just saw a clip because I never watch uh, Impact or TNA or anything because it's, uh, you know, awful. But it was from when you were there, and it was him, I guess, as Eli Drake, and I think it may have been Chris Masters or someone. They come into your office, yeah. and they want to change their number from number one in whatever the match was. Some rumble-type situation. And you change it to number two. He was great in that. I'm watching it. He's got, like, those fucking eyes. Like, what do you mean you don't have Mountain Dew? Like, he's got those fucking... Yeah. Like he bugs out, and you believe that he's this tweaked-out wrestler. He's I'm such a fan of L.A. Knight. He's the highlight of that show that is in the bloodline. And that's, you know, he's got the movements, and he's got the facials, and he's animated, and he can talk. He's got a line of bullshit. And, you know, once again, is, is he ready to, you know, replace Londos or Longson on the all-time box office attraction list maybe not but look at the fucking current crop we've got today in every company you can't mean to tell me he's not in the upper percentile of something and if you have fan reactions like that you have to ride that wave don't you you gotta surf it you gotta surf. well you ought to know that hawaiian brian you know the surfer lingo i said ride that wave and then you went you gotta surf it yeah you gotta you gotta hang 10 i don't even have to go to hawaii to hang 10 i can just stand here and smile uh Anyway, so then L.A. Knight tried to pop uh, Rey Mysterio's hood off, but Pablo Escobar ran in and ran him off. That's what happened. And then in the back, I wrote, Solo spiked some guy. And then I realized it was Ridge Holland. I had the same reaction. I was like, man, this is a cool idea, but it's just some generic bald wrestler in the back yeah. like we've never seen before. Until Seamus came out, I had no idea it was Rich Holland. I thought it was well, just that's because we're used guy. to seeing him with his fucking Dickens-like fucking cap and the suspenders and the jeans and the, you know, is that a coal miner's outfit from Wales or whatever the brawling brutes wear? But yeah, so he ran into Ridge Holland in the back and took exception to him and spiked him. And uh, Ridge did a great job of selling it, coughing. You know, you're supposed oh, yeah. to, your windpipe, right? That's would be what that would affect. So Seamus found out about it and got really pissed off and went out into the arena and told everybody that he's calling Solo out for a bleeding fight later on. So later on, we're going to have a bleeding fight. But right now, we got a bleeding girls tag team match. I wouldn't put it like that. I guess it... <laughs> Well, now, we don't know. Don't put it like that. No. We do not have any evidence <laughs> to make any assumption. It, it's just a, 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 a figure of speech is what it is from across the pond. That's right. Of course, there is four girls in this, and there's four weeks in a month. You got a 25% chance. All right, before I do any oh, more Steiner math. Stop. Yes. So this was for the the women's tag team title because both of these teams were champions Rhonda and Shayna were the champions of one show and the other team earth and fire wind was off this this particular evening they were the champions of the other show so they're going to unify the belts and basically Rhonda and Shayna tapped both the baby faces out at the same time 
and won the belts and and they just brought earth and fire up from developmental anyway so that was quick and then Ronda, but at least we don't have to worry about there being a dispute in the women's tag team division because now it's unified. So now they're going to have to come up with another women's tag team title to put on the women's tag teams that work all the time rather than just part of the time. But then Ronda called Raquel out because she wants a rematch for the tag team title with her and Liv, who is where, who lost the tag team title to Ronda and Shayna. And then Liv came out, and they had a big four-way face-off. Nothing happened, but they just faced off. And the only other thing I noticed was Liv Morgan was wearing heels, and she was the same height as Ronda and Shayna, while Raquel was wearing heels, and she was a foot taller than everybody in the ring. And that was the tallest I've ever seen Liv Morgan. And it's, a, again... She, she was on stilts to be even with Rhonda and Shayna in wrestling boots, and then Raquel, who's taller than everybody, is wearing heels, so she looks like Andrea, the Lady Giant. And they were just teasing Raquel and Rhea on Monday. Which is where we were hoping they would go, because that might look interesting. Now we got to live Morgan back in this thing, and her tiny little minute, microscopic, microbiotic ass. <laughs> what? You... <laughs> You're too much sometimes. Oh, fuck. Well, God damn, you need a microscope just to see her fucking face. She's not that small. She's tiny, is what she is. She's an amoeba. <laughs> That's, I'm just, this is your I'm, show. <laughs> she said she's a microbe. She's a small minute particle a particle she's a particle is what she is all right on smackdown also they went wallering with grayson and he had as his guest purely deadly and i wrote not a fucking chance this ridiculous alleged personality with his fake talk show and the overblown introduction this doesn't get a heat when nobody cares about this guy to begin with, again, there's a reason why major names in wrestling hosted alleged talk segments. It's because they were big names. You don't just give a guy a talk segment and it makes him a big name. And these two, they're dressed however the fuck. They ought to be on Let's Make a Deal. I did see that the street sweepers came out singing and howling about halfway through this and just got in the ring, and they went to the break, and when they came back, they were having a match. So this segment went 10 minutes across the top of the hour, and then uh, that would have run, I would think, most people off, and then they came back with a tag team match with the Street Sweepers and Grizzly Death, and that would have run the rest of them off. What'd you think? I didn't watch any of this stuff. I think It I'll... ran you off. Yeah, this stuff has to go back to Sean's NXT. I don't like it. Ogie dogie, but up next... Charlotte versus Lacey Evans. And now, apparently, the only thing that we have been told as to why that they want to take Lacey Evans out behind the barn and old yeller her is that she's apparently one of these nuts that can't stop put her, putting her foot in her mouth on social media, either saying autism is fake or vaccines cause leprosy or I don't, you know, I would think even being a right wing lunatic in that company because of Vince and his friends, you wouldn't get too much heat, but apparently she's got heat for being off kilter in some fashion because this wasn't just a squash. This was a uh, Charlotte was, she looked incredible she she's looks like a fucking star. Her shit's great, but Lacey was selling everything big, and she was trying to put everything into her performance. She's got great heel facials, even though she shook a kid a, a kid's hand at when she came out, and then told all the rest of the fans to salute her. So that's a mixed message. But this was not even 
a squash match. This was a squash match where the star was showing how little effort it took. Did you catch that? She was playing with her. Even yeah. on the quick quick matches on this program, they don't often, except if it's just some guy we've never heard of, the already in the ring character, they don't often have somebody beaten quickly and the person doing it making fun of how easy it is. But on this one, they did. <laughs> so what the fuck is... is Huh, maybe Lacey needs to go to All Friends Wrestling if she can make any friends. Yeah, it's going to be a story one day. Just what the hell was going on with this Lacey Evans push, stop, push, stop, push, stop, gimmick change? What the hell? <laughs> Wait a minute. Push, stop, push, stop, push, Actually, stop, gimmick change. Do you remember when Hammer time. Wasn't she feuding with Charlotte when she got pregnant and had to leave because they were doing the thing where Ric Flair was into her? That's right. I just remembered that. It's like, what, five years ago or something? <laughs> oh, my God. All right. Well, anyway, Charlotte figure aided her with uh, she, the legitimate offense that Lacey Evans got was she stopped Charlotte and missed a flip. <laughs> and, and Charlotte took back over. Oh, my God. Uh, but then after the match, Oscar came in and kicked Charlotte and got heat on her and Lacey Evans limped off. Do you remember the days when if a heel came in to get heat on a baby face that they were shooting an angle or he's working a program with after the baby face had beaten some other heel, the other heel would stick around and help just out of principle and, you know, heels stick together. Even if it was a job guy, the heel got a chance to get some fucking, you know, he'd go. And then that was somebody that when the save came that you could feed for a fucking bump and the top heel would go on and bail out no contact. Now the, the defeated heel just accepts their punishment and walks dejectedly back to the locker room. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. So main event time. And I was a uh, scared of this one, Brian, because Solo Sokoa versus Seamus, they rang the bell with 20 minutes left on the air. And I'm thinking, my God, um, I hope they're not going to go 20 minutes in this match. Before we talk about the match, did you notice all night they were saying the Cajun Dome in Louisiana? We're at the Cajun Dome in Louisiana. And that's another, uh, I heard that Vince was changing matches and pulling segments, and that's another Vince thing. As I remember my geography, the Cajun Dome is in Lafayette, Louisiana. Is it not? What town were they in? The specific city in the state of Louisiana were they in? I believe it's in Lafayette, but I don't know if they said that on the show. Exactly, because Vince, gave, he, he doesn't want to say the name of a fucking town that he thinks sounds podunk or too small to host a national television program. So everybody has to jump through hoops to figure out some kind of way to, to write the, the Chiron, the, the, you know, the identifier where we are, the graphic or to say it. And sometimes he likes the name of the arena or, you know, uh, and didn't they do one time, didn't they do Greater New York or the New York metropolitan area for some place in New Jersey or something? There was something like that. I was going to say upstate New York. There was something like that. But the point is, if he thinks it, it... So the Cajun Dome sounds great, but why does Lafayette, Louisiana have that much heat, right? It's a, it's a fucking recognized town. They've got... They're big enough to have the Cajun Dome. Seems like they could have a TV show, but that's another Vinceism. When you see the town not identified that they're in, Vince don't like it. Anyway, speaking of not liking something, they they worked hard. They started hot. They kept it up. They went back and forth. There was no long heat or big major comebacks or whatever. It was good stiff stuff. But and it, 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 did you like the match? 
eh, you know, I'm not a big Seamus guy, and uh, I like Solo when he's used more as an enforcer or maybe a tag team partner. It was all right, I guess. I didn't particularly love it. I'm not going to watch it again ever. A lot of flat-footed kicking and punching. Uh, but anyway, the finish was basically Solo spiked Seamus, and he took the bump through the ropes to the floor. And so that way he couldn't be pinned in the ring, but Solo goes out and rock bottoms him on the desk and then sets him in, in sitting down in front of the barricade and gets a running charge and turns around and gives him the ass in the face through the barricade. And the referee immediately calls it. He says, Seamus is out. He's not able to continue. The doctors come and check on him. The agents are out there immediately. Think of what we've seen done to people and think of how long they've sold it down like they were fucking dead, like they were ready to be laid out and have words spoken over them. And it takes however long for the referee to catch up. Hey, this guy might not be breathing anymore, but, but this guy takes an ass in the face. And boom. So, okay. But they got to get a reason to get the Usos out there. So, as Solo is trying to fight the doctors off from helping Seamus, Usos' music plays, and they get a big pop. And here they come, and each of them hits a super kick on Solo, and then a double super kick, and they leave Solo flat, and they menace Heyman, and he somehow manages to get off the ring and out of, without tipping it over and get out of there. And then they kick Solo again and give him a double splash off the opposite top turnbuckle. So poor Solo took the brunt of that. But the Usos are back in town. And that's where we went off the air. <sighs> what do you think? Was that a satisfactory ending to this episode of SmackDown? Well, the, they're promoting a tag team match and one of the guys wasn't there. And I know the limitations with Roman, but that is a problem when your biggest star in the company doesn't make all the TVs and the main event of the pay-per-view, for all intents and purposes, the main event of Money in the Bank is this tag team match. And, you know, so the two baby faces got to beat up one heel. But yeah, okay. But I, I, I mean, they can't all be winners. It wasn't the... It wasn't the, uh, you know, revelation of a bloodline defection or shocking, you know, turn of events, but you can't do that every week or it becomes obviously normal. So, yeah, this was what it was. Yeah. What is Roman doing? I mean, we heard that he wanted to go to Hollywood. Has he gone to Hollywood? Is he making anything? Where is yeah, he? Yeah, he's, he's, he's there. He's got an apartment now on Wilshire Boulevard. He's just hanging out, goes to the pool a lot every day. I don't know what he's fucking doing. It's not my week to watch him. But if he's not actively acting in a movie, it seems like he ought to be at TV every week. And it seems like they could afford, now that they're worth $9 billion, to fucking pay him to be at TV every week, doesn't it? You would think if he's pulling in the numbers that he's pulling in, they would want that there as often as possible. Yeah, well, you've raised a good statement there, though, or a good question. In term, yes, we understand why when The Rock was shooting all these movies, he couldn't come back and be on, or was Cena, or Austin at one point, or whatever, but Roman, you know, I want to do a lot of things, but since I'm not able to, I'm right here talking to you. So I'm wondering what Roman's doing that he can't come to TV. All the time, right? He, okay, let's say he got a deal that says I only have to make X amount of dates. Well, now that every time he shows up, the ratings go through the roof, wouldn't you be talking to him about some more fucking dates? Maybe his agent says that he has to meet all these famous casting directors or all these big casting directors on a Friday afternoon and evening. Well, that's why he always gets to the show when it's about an hour and a half over with. That's why he's always late, but he's still there. When they pull up for a live television show at 9.30 and the show goes off the air at 10 o'clock, is that not some kind of tip-off that it was prearranged? Because after all, with traffic, you never know. That was SmackDown.
What do you know, Brian? What do you know? What does the Arcadian Vanguard family of podcasts know? What's going on this week? Another fine week of programming on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes, of course, the wrestling news. Every day, get your free wrestling daily newscast every morning. Wake up and find out everything that's happened. No opinion, no conjecture, no star ratings, just the wrestling news. Get it today wherever you find your favorite podcast. Look for Arcadian Vanguards, the wrestling news, or get it directly from thewrestlingnews.com. A few other notes. This week coming up, I'm breaking kayfabe with Bowdrin and Barry. Their guest will be Dottie Curtis. Coming off her appearance on Dark Side of the Ring, hear more stories about the classic days of championship wrestling from Florida, Eddie Graham, Don Curtis, and so much more. At BaldrinPod.com, or look for Breaking Kayfabe with Baldrin and Barry, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! Go through the archives today at 605pod.com. They're available wherever you find your favorite podcast, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership. All right, mother. Let's talk, before we get into collision, because of our strange wrestling uh, recording schedule, strange wrestling, strange recording schedule this past week, we didn't have the ratings for dynamite from this past wednesday when we reviewed the program do you have that information at your fingertips now brian i do this past week's AEW dynamite june 21st on tnt was watched by 902 thousand viewers on average how in the flying fuck did they get 902 thousand people to stick with that stinker and what <laughs> What is the the pattern when they do something on Wednesday night that's remotely acceptable to the viewer that one would think people would be interested in? They're down at 800. But when they have something that pretty much stinks from top to bottom, it boosts them about it is are people watching for the car crash mentality? This is this is so rotten we can't believe it. More people must see this and give us their opinion. What's going on here? There may be some examples of that here. Let's go to the numbers. These were compiled by WrestleNomics. Quarter 1, 8 to 8.15 p.m. The Guns versus the Hardys, with the post-match of CM Punk, FTR, Ricky Starks, the Guns, and Bullet Club Gold running in. 932,000 viewers. And that's uh, better than normal to start out with. Let's see if they kept them to quarter two. To your earlier theory, quarter two, 8.15, 8.30 p.m., Jeff Jarrett versus Mark Briscoe concession stand brawl with picture-in-picture picture and the Blackpool Combat Club promo, 976,000 viewers. Jesus Christ! When's the last time that they gained over 40,000 people in the second quarter instead of lost some? I don't Ever? Again, a lot of different things could play into that. I personally think that if you were someone not watching and you heard CM Punk appeared, you may have thought he could appear again, and that didn't happen, or you may have tuned in because you heard he just was there. But also, you know, these concession stand matches and arena matches, whatever AEW does, I would think, without knowing for sure, those lend themselves better to picture-in-picture picture than regular matches, just because... If you're flipping through, what the fuck is that? What's happening there? So I wonder if that lends itself to the rating, too. I have no idea. But uh, Mark Briscoe should be a ratings draw, but he's not been presented as one, and Jeff Jarrett has not so far scored anything like that. So let's move on. See where we go from here. Quarter 3, 8.30 to 8.45 p.m. A recap of Collision, as well as Chris Jericho, Minoru Suzuki and Sammy Guevara versus A.R. Fox, Action Andretti, and Darius Martin with picture in picture, 926,000 viewers. 
Okay, well, it's going in the direction that I would imagine that match would go in. They lost 50,000, but they've still got such a big number. That's insane. Quarter four, 8.45 to 9 p.m. The end of the previously said six-man tag match. The Chris Jericho Sting live promo confrontation. The Elite, uh, it just says the Elite. I don't know. Oh, <laughs> the Elite Eddie Kingston promo in the back. And Adam Cole's live promo, 965,000 viewers. What the fuck? <laughs> and they're back up another 40. What is different about this show than any other show they've ever done? Besides much of it was the shits. Well, that's not really different. Again, we also don't know, although it's a small audience that watches New Japan Wrestling on TV in America, we know that for a fact. We also don't know what percentage of the New Japan fans who don't watch AEW tuned in specifically to see any of their guys, knowing it's the lead up to the pay-per-view. Again, who knows? But I don't buy it. It didn't happen last year. No, it didn't. And that was awful TV all around that uh, event last year. But let's go to the big 9 o'clock hour, segment 5, 9 to 9.15 p.m. Adam Cole and MJF live promo. And then Orange Cassidy and Shibata. Oh my. Versus Daniel Garcia and Zack Sabre Jr. with picture in picture. Okay, that is a test. 962,000 viewers. <laughs> they lost 3,000. No, well, again, who lost the 3,000? Not, not to spoil anything, but let's go right into segment well, six. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It should have been when you got that fucking pockets debacle for 20 something minutes they've got to be you've got to be what restrained to the chair tied down so you can't reach the remote well segment 6 9 15 and 9 30 the continuation of cassidy and shibata versus garcia and saber jr with picture in picture eight hundred and thirty-three thousand viewers okay that makes more sense a hundred and thirty thousand. So that's where everybody said, okay, fuck it. We've seen MJF. We've seen CM Punk. Show's over. That's it. This is, again, this is the most bizarre. They start ahead of where they usually start. They never gain in the second quarter, and they do. They lose in the third quarter, but they gain the same thing back in the fourth quarter. Stay steady at the top of the hour, and then... Pockets drives off 130,000 people. This is a wild show, wild, weird, wacky show. And again, if we're going based on trends, and who knows what percentage of an audience tunes in just to see if CM Punk's going to show up here, and then he did, and how many people tuned in right after he did, but MJF and Adam Cole, whatever we think about it, it's been working as far as ratings. Their segments have been popping the number. So it is bad placement of that Shibata Orange Cassidy match right after that but I have to wonder after MJF and Adam Cole appear and you pretty much know they're not going to be back on the show the rest of the show how many people said the show's over yeah maybe it's a hundred thousand people here who knows but segment seven 9 30 to 9 45 p.m the Will Ospreay Don Callis backstage confrontation Tony Storm uh Yes, a Tony Storm Willow Nightingale video and Taya Valkyrie versus Chris Statlander with picture in picture, 804,000 viewers. Okay, I mean, they, it could have been worse with that 15 minutes, but they only lost another 29,000 people. So they, in, in a space of two quarters, they've shed 158,000 people. And finally, segment 8, 9.45 to 10 p.m., Continuation of Statlander versus Valkyrie. The live promo with Eddie Kingston, John Moxley, and then the introduction of Tomohiro Ishii, and then Brian Danielson calling out Okada, and the appearance of Okada, 818,000 viewers. Okay, so people came back to see if there was going to be a main event, and they found out there wasn't. All righty then. Woo. Do you think, well, I mean, we're about to talk about collision. Do you think Tony saw these numbers and unfortunately, as it happens every now and then, got a little bit overzealous about the numbers and that led to what was collision this week? 
It's possible because their first hour of Dynamite would be a nice, respectable television program if they had cut it off there, but the second hour brought them to an untimely end. But yeah, because I was looking forward to Collision and what we got last week, we got Collision, which top to bottom was not the greatest show in the world. There was Wardlow and Hoosie Wutsy, but it was refreshing and refreshingly different and most of it was good what we got this week was the same kind of energy in the main event and a couple of very good segments and it, more dynamite ishness to it it felt like that to me didn't it you that's why you said that wasn't it it did i mean look there are still some real positives they began with those promos back to back almost like the old saturday night's main event yeah, uh, and I thought that was a nice start. It can't be understated. Two weeks in, what a breath of fresh air! But beyond that, what a great job they're doing, Kevin Kelly and Nigel McGuinness. Yeah, they alone make this show more tolerable than Dynamite. They are already the best announced team of the year, and we'll see how the rest of the year plays out. So those are the positives. The negatives. It began with a Chris Jericho segment that belonged on Dynamite because immediately yeah. you're telling people who, whether fairly or not, you know, AEW always said, like, we never really said sports-based wrestling. People who fairly or not believed that Collision was going to be a different tone, a different show, a lot of the shit we don't want to see will stay on Wednesday nights. They started this week's show with the epitome of a Wednesday night segment. And unfortunately, and like you said, the they started out, the cold open was the two eight-man teams for the main event doing wrestling promos. No scripted bullshit. Sounded like wrestlers. They go into Elton John. There's energy. <laughs> they come out, the new announcers, the, you know, blah, blah, blah. Everything. And then Tony Schiavone's in the ring. Who will be Sting and Darby Allen's partner? And as he's introducing Sting and Darby Allen, Jericho music. And here comes Jericho and Grandpa Suzuki with no Sammy. And when they get in the ring, did you notice for the interview with Tony, Jericho had his own microphone already. And he just he just tells Tony to shut up and proceeds to do a monologue and ignore Tony, the interviewer in the ring, which is what they do on Wednesday. And it took forever, and it lost the momentum, and there was a lot of pauses, and they want to know who the third guy is, and blah, blah, blah. Maybe it's Mabel. And then finally, Jericho is threatening Tony Schiavone with the bat. Well, you know who it is, so tell me. And Tony's not a, a good actor at acting threatened because he hasn't got a lot of experience with it because you're not supposed to take bats to the announcers. But besides that, when Sting's music starts playing, Jericho has just threatened him with a bat. Instead of taking the distraction as an opportunity to get the fuck out of there, Tony has to go, it's Sting! And here comes Sting and Darby. And at least Darby did the promo telling Sammy or, you know, saying that Sammy doesn't need Jericho. He never needed you, blah, blah, blah. But here was the big reveal of the partner. Darby says, our partner, you know who it is. He beat you at the Tokyo Dome. You know who it is. And he put the microphone down and never said it. So Jericho may know, but I don't fucking know. And then out comes again playing generic music from New Japan that sounds like the shit that WCW used to license in the early 90s. Here comes a guy in a white suit and a cape. And the the people in the arena, because it's Toronto. Stealing my look. Well, there you go. And see, I told you not to invest in that cape factory. But it's Toronto where the fans are the smartest of the smart. So there, some of them are chanting, NATO, NATO. NATO, not NATO. 
Well, finally, the announcers have to say, yes, this is Tetsuya Nato. And apparently he's the one that Donald Trump was mad at because all I used to hear was Trump wanted to fucking get rid of NATO, get rid of NATO. No, that's NATO. Not that's what Naito. I said. Not Naito. You're confusing Naito and NATO. No, Naito. Trump never said Naito. He was saying NATO. Right. Yeah, that's what I said. That has nothing to do with Naito. No, it's this guy NATO in the white suit. No, that's so, Naito in the white suit. You mean he, t- he stole this guy's suit? Who stole his suit? NATO. NATO. Or Naito. Naito no stole NATO's whose suit? suit. Na- no, there is no NATO. NATO is Naito. Na- uh, NATO is also an organization, North American uh, trade, North Atlantic. Uh, fuck, what is it? Why don't you say what it is, big guy? It's NAFTA. North American anyway, Free Trade Agreement. That's right. Um, so he walks to the ring in the white outfit, like every. It, the, all these guys from New Japan, they just come out and walk to the ring. There's no excitement. There's no, they don't look physically impressive. He, you know, he's got a fucking offbeat tailor. I'll give him that. And he gets in the ring and gets face to face with Jericho. And nobody says anything. And then Jericho and Grandpa Suzuki turn and get out of the ring. And that was it. And I wrote, we're 15 minutes into the show, and I'm fucking asleep. At the, Last week, I was excited. This week, I'm asleep. Um, this belonged on Dynamite. If you want to make people think that it's going to be a different tone, a different kind of show, this does not belong here. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why Sammy wasn't there. They were just like, he's not here tonight. Okay, I don't know if there's anything to read into that. You know, Naito's good. He's really good. I haven't seen him in a while. But a lot of these guys I used to watch in New Japan looked a lot older than they used to when they came out. Now, of course, we all get older. But after a while, I don't know. You know what the other thing is? If you don't know who any of these guys are, it just seems like everyone in New Japan now, it's all just a wacky hairdo. There you go. Another guy with funny hair. Every single New Japan guy that shows up, it's always the hairdo. Inoki looked completely different from Fujinami who looked completely different from fucking Kobayashi, who looked completely dead, and Jumbo looked obviously different than Baba. But, you know, uh, everybody had their own thing going. Now they just want goofy haircuts. Anyway, uh, Miro is still highly upset with God, but it sounds good on the promos. He announced he was atheist. That was a first on wrestling TV. He denounced his wife, his God, and everything else. But he sounds like he's got things figured out now. No more Pip Sabian. That's the most important thing. But I like the pre-tapes. He sounds ominous with his delivery. He looks like a beast. It just... I, again, I, I would love for... When somebody writes the tell-all book of all the stupid shit that has gone on in AEW since the start... Was it Miro's idea to come in as Pip's friend, you know, benefactor to Minnie Mouse and all that hoo-ha that ruined our opinion of him that we didn't have to begin with because I hadn't seen him anywhere else? And then this was hiding there. Or was it, did Tony force it on him? Did he think it was a good idea? Does he, is he best friends with little Pip? What was the cause of all that? I've got to know one day. You know what I need to know today? No. Brian? No. Again, I defer to you as the Japanese expert. The next match was Swerve versus Tanahashi. Explain to me. And I know, I'm sure we have reviewed a Tanahashi match at some point. I think, you know, we we watched Twinkle Toes in the Tokyo Dome one time, and we've seen a couple of these crossover promotions. I don't remember any of the matches, which indicates what a impact they made on me. But can you explain to me, by watching this match between Tanahashi and Swerve Strickland, how anybody that has never seen Tanahashi before is supposed to think that he's worth, as Mama Cornette used to say, 
a tinker's dam. I have seen great Tanahashi matches. His matches with Okada were, you know, before anyone talked about Omega and Okada, it was all about Tanahashi and Okada. He was one of the people that really kept New Japan going for uh, several of the lean years. With that said, he looked he looked old. Mm-hmm. And this match was not particularly impressive. This match was the least not good, at least not good match, or least good match, or... This match was bad, and all I'm thinking is, how the fuck is MJF going to work with this guy? I had a little bit of optimism yeah. just based on things... I've seen it in the past, but after watching this guy and Swerve, and again, Swerve and MJF are very different workers, and I also think more than likely MJF will try to find a way to work around. Oh, he'll be smarter about it, but yeah. what have you got to work with? He looks broken down from the last time I had seen him, yeah. Again, I said, I said, okay, let's see this superstar get over here on American television with a... Live audience, let's see him tear the house down or, you know, make an impact or whatever. At one point, he did a crossbody, got up, pantomime taking something off of himself and handing it to Swerve, and then played air guitar. And then I wondered, is Tanahashi injured? Because Does he walk like that or run like that normally? Or was he limping? I think he has years of... Uh... Japanese wrestling mileage on his body. And okay. like I said, he, he didn't always move like that, but he is does 46. That expre- does that explain why his strikes look like shit, such as forearms or punches if he attempted them? No. So I understand Tanahashi's on the pay-per-view. I don't understand why, but I understand he's on it, so they got to promote it. So couldn't they have given this guy a five-minute win over griff garrison or any fucking body in to, to promote the pay-per-view instead of sacrificing swerve strickland by having him do a job to a guy that looks like he just was in a car wreck and being in a bad match that did let me ask you this if you've never seen tanahashi and you're on the fence about buying the pay-per-view but yo tanahashi versus mjf after seeing this match, did this match sell you the pay-per-view Oh, no. Oh, no. So why do this? And the finish was that Tanahashi climbed up to the top rope and then slipped off the top rope and didn't fall to... went down to his feet on the apron, climbed back up, they fought on the turnbuckle, and then he knocked Swerve off and gave him a shitty frog splash. In this company, that was the lowest frog splash I've ever seen. Every job guy does one. Boom, but this one, two, three. And I wrote, this was a Wednesday night match if I've ever seen one. And we were 30 minutes into the show at this point. And then MJF bops up on the screen and he says, I've told Tony that I insist on being first match on the pay-per-view. And now I know why. Because even with that pre-show, four matches or whatever, they're going to be fifth. And MJF against this guy cannot follow 12 more fucking matches where they'll have seen everything, including all the shit that Tanahashi apparently ain't going to be able to do because he needs to be in a body cast. Your thoughts? I was, I don't want to say disappointed. I didn't like the match. Didn't make me want to see more Tanahashi. I think Swerve's impressive, but they just seem to not want to do anything with him. He made Swerve look bad. Made Swerve look clumsy. And again, I can't understand or explain how they've been booking Swerve if he's someone who they want to do something with. Uh, you know, the, I guess the, the positive is whatever fans showed up there and they sold out for the pay-per-view, they did not sell out for a collision. A lot of those fans were the fans who knew who Tanahashi was, and they were a very forgiving audience because they were able to react to his high fly flow, which is his frog splash. Oh, boy. Take, the, take the word high out of it. But it didn't look good, and he didn't look good, and uh, we'll see how that well, pay- and, pay-per-view match goes. That'll be something. And, and you're right. These are the most dedicated of the dedicated because they sold out the pay-per-view 
in the same building the following night and then added this later. That's why the tickets were dribbling and then all the confusion to whether Punk was going to be there. And then, of course, this audience was the one predisposed not to like him because these are the people that were predisposed not to like Punk to begin with because these are the people that don't have to worry about spending their money on their children or their wives or girlfriends because they don't have any of those. They just worship the buckaroos. So we had a small, vociferous audience. Uh, the next match, what did you think of Andre and our friend Brody King from the House of Blech? I didn't like it as much as I liked the Brody, the Brody, the uh, Buddy Matthews match last week. Brody ain't nobody, is he? And nobody cares for me. You know, the other thing is, in an era when everyone is just tatted up, you don't really stand yeah. that anymore when you're just a big guy with tattoos. Everyone has them. The Vikings no, he, have them over here, and this guy has them over here. Everyone has them. No, you know why he stands out? No. Because between the zebra print on his gear and the tattoos on the rest of his body that shows besides his gear, he looks like one of those goddamn kaleidoscope things that hypnotize you. If somebody was just to hang him by a rope and turn him around and around... You could fucking hypnotize the entire audience. Well, I don't know if it achieved that goal here. The audience seemed like they were in a trance. They really are doing an Andrade House of Black feud, it appears. Uh, Malachi couldn't make it, but his mystical powers are able to fuck with the uh, lighting system somehow. You know what? They were in Canada. Wonder what Malachi has back in his criminal record. Wonder about Sammy. Well, Sammy's hey. on the paper. Isn't Sammy on the pay per view? I don't know. I'm just making shit up. All right. Well, listen, Mr. Making Things Up. Well, if somebody don't go to Canada, sometimes there's things wrong. I was already in a pretty sour mood about this show just because yeah. it opened feeling like Dynamite. The Tanahashi match felt like the kind of thing you would see on Dynamite, and it wasn't impressive. Andrade had that good match last week. Did they go as long this week? It felt like they went as long this week, and it just wasn't the same match. I didn't well, like it as much. that's the thing. They Maybe if they'd had the matches in reverse order, because... Both these guys worked hard, and they were serious about it. There was some modern bullshit going on. Um, but they were trying to... They didn't go out on the floor endlessly. They didn't bury the referee. That's You can tell that the, the in-ring matches on this program are trying to be serious as opposed to the indie bullshit that Wednesday does. But the problem is, Brody King ain't Buddy Matthews. Brody King's a big guy... And he's got a lot of tattoos cover up the fact he doesn't have any muscles. But Buddy has oomph to him. We've talked about his work and just his oomph and his look. Brody King is kind of big and kind of bleh. And his faces, facials are kind of eh. And he doesn't really have a third gear. He's like an indie version of Buddy Matthews. So they had the match last week, and it was a lot better than this one. I wrote, this one has gone on too long, just some flat-footed back and forth, and Brody is nobody, is what I wrote. And then Andre got the figure four and was going to, you know, do the bridge for the figure eight, and Julia Hart got up on the apron with his Andre's mask that he wears to the ring that he then takes off for his match. So Andre has the finishing hold on the guy, but he lets go of the figure four and gets up and asks for his mask, just stands there looking. If you can't hit a girl and she's got your shit, aren't you going to go and snatch it away from her? You don't have to knock her out, but you're going to snatch your shit. He just stands there, then turns back around and ducks a clothesline and gets the figure four back on, on Brody. And then that's when Buddy hits. That's another reason why their names are too confusing, Brody and Buddy. And he gets disqualified. And th that finish was performed in pretty much the most perfunctory way that it could be done. But then Buddy and Brody both beat up Andre, and uh, the corpse referee, the useless boy, he was the fucking referee, so he just jumps out on the floor and makes faces. And nobody comes to help and Malachi Black's face pops up on the screen, and the heels stare at him, and then the lights go out, 
and the announcers start pitching to the fucking matches we're going to see later on. This was, a, again, Wednesday night bullshit with their appearing, disappearing, lights out, wax on, wax off, the clapper, whatever the fuck. Yeah, no, I'm sold on Buddy Matthews. They should get him away from this, somehow give him a new name or a gimmick that you can, you're can. you not denying who he once was, but he's become a different person. Maybe Buddy freaking Matthews? I don't know. <laughs> but no, seriously, just do something else with him because he's good and he's dragged down by this nonsense. You saw him say to Julia when to put up the mask. So you even yeah. got to see that spot get called. Andrade's the baby face, I guess? Yeah, yeah. Is Andrade the reason Sammy's not there? I don't know. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Could it be that Andrade, Andrade said, uh, I'll, I'll punch him again if I get the chance. If you make me go to Canada, I'm going to punch Sammy Guevara. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God damn it. All righty. Anyway, the top of the nine o'clock hour on this program. And I, I really was looking forward to this. And I told Stace last week, you know, this is a program that I might start watching as it happens on a Saturday evening, rather than knowing ahead of time, I'm going to want to fast forward through a lot of shit, but now we're 50, 50, we're one and one anyway. Top of the nine o'clock hour, Tony introduces Christian Cage and Dino Douche. And even though Tony, uh, Christian actually knows how to work with an interviewer, even though he has to boost Tony's arm up, Tony gets tired and the microphone starts drooping. But Christian, I think he and Punk, I wouldn't mind if they just did dueling 30 minute promos. One guy go 30, the other guy go 30, then the other guy tag back in, do two hours that way. I don't know that I'd mind that as bad as I do these normal programs because he can fucking talk. And nobody wrote this shit for him. And he's doing it brilliantly. And he savaged the his hometown of Toronto. And then and and the the heelish demeanor of him and the big goof in the back. And Christian has the belt over his shoulder, even though the dinosaur won it. And he acts like he's the champion. You know, that was great stuff. But the best line was, you know, Tony, I left the show last week in a really bad mood. Because you know this story, right? The bad mood quote. Or have you even heard about this? I don't know. Last week. After Collision got raves by us and many people, and it was actually a wrestling program rather than their normal caca, Uncle Dave tweeted out or printed in something, whatever, it was a quote from him, that he talked to one top star who went home in a bad mood from the show and said it's like a ticking time bomb with him there. Something's going to happen eventually. <laughs> Talking about punk. When <laughs> so Christian, to make fun of that stupidity, that, yeah, I left the show last week in a really bad mood. But can you believe, they're what still is trying What has happened to Dave? I, I can't explain it. I really can't. They're still trying it. And somebody on Twitter said, why did Jericho leave the show in a bad mood? Did somebody ask him where his wife was on January 6th? <laughs> but anyway, again, it's, and as this audience they had here shows, they've gotten to the core group of the Buckaroo Banzai fans to poison them against punk. Don't ruin Buckaroo Banzai and associate it with the young bucks. All right. But anyway, they, 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 they're still trying. And especially because they saw that at least last week and in his segments, especially punk puts on a television program that a wrestling fan can stomach watching instead of just a fucking either a 10 year old mentally or a 40 year old virgin. Um, they had interviews with all of the, Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have any comments about Christian's promo? Nah, it was fine. Thank you for not looking that forward. Up. Not looking forward to seeing more of them feuding with Wardlow. So, oh God, no, no! I just want to hear Christian talk. 
And if they can keep the dinosaur just standing back there as window dressing without having to see him work, that'll be a plus. But they did then do a promo package where we had comments from everybody in the Owen Hart tournament. And again, Kojima, I guess, is going to wrestle Punk. <sighs> the way that I'm seeing this, unless there are major upsets, and I'm not talking about a major upset in terms of we're trying to get this young superstar over an established veteran to further his career. I'm talking about a major upset in the sense of how the fuck would they think that was a good idea to book that fucking finish? The final's going to be Samoa Joe and CM Punk, and I'm all in favor of that. Hopefully, just because I've stooged this obviousness, they won't change it, but Anyway, then on this program, we had Nyla Rose against Willow Nightingale. And Marina Schaefer is now Nyla Rose's manager. How many has she had now? Uh, two. Vicky Guerrero. Well, didn't Vicky, Vicky went away and then she was in some other group, wasn't she? Or had somebody else with her? Did she ever have Mark Sterling as her manager? Uh, something like that. I don't know. It's Stokely? So I don't know. Stokely Carmichael, possibly. Stokely Hathaway. Him too. Whatever happened to him? Um, well, you know, his wife Jane was the breadwinner in that family. Anyway, we had that match. And then I was, once again, a small grain of hope, optimism, smoking the hopium. Powerhouse Hobbs came to the ring without QT Marshall, and there was no, that I heard no mention of QT Marshall in conjunction with Hobbs. Did you hear anything? No, and that was the brightest thing about this uh, whole segment, was the idea that maybe they got Hobbs finally away from QT. And just on his own, if they don't want to give him a legitimate manager, then just let him be on his own. He either needs a, a legitimate well, which there is none in that company anyway, manager to elevate him or he needs to be on his own, do his own talking and do exactly what he did here. Four years late, they started the game. They start everybody out in competitive dream matches and four years later, they finally get a win in a squash, but he beat Jeremy Prophet in seconds in a dominant fashion and that's exactly what it should have been. And except for the main event, that was the whole program. And that's why we were, Brian and I, I'm, I'm speaking to the greater assemblage of listeners out there, why we were downtrodden and downhearted and kind of bummed out by what we thought was going to be a, a, a kind of a guaranteed bright spot after last week on Saturday nights. But they brought it up at the end. Should we go into the main event, Brian? Please, it was actually good. An eight-man tag team match. We've gotten away from the six-man tags. Now we're going to... And now, if they call the six-man tags trios, does that mean this is a quattro or quadraphonic? Well, definitely not quadraphonic. That would be with the sound. Okay, then it's got to be a quattro, right? Uh, I, I guess it could be. See, that's how silly trios is, to call a six-man tag match a trios match. But would it be quattros? It's not trio, it's trios. So would it be quattros match? And that's what I said, a quattros match. Oh, I thought you said quattro singularly. Well, whatever it may be. Point is, and then if they have a ten-man like the Anarchy in the Arena, is that going to be a quintos? Might better just use the goddamn numbers. What about quartet match? Well, that would be a tag. A quartet match? Yeah. Well, your tag team, your, your team is the quartet. No. The whole match is the quartet. Well, why does that have to be the rules? And then, and then give them one of them a violin and the other one an oboe and the other one a guitar, and you'd have a string quartet. I'll take the guy with the oboe. Well, I used to know a guy played an old oboe. Used to play it across his knee. Play me a song, oh, Curtis Lowe, oh, Curtis Lowe. All right, anyway. These are so, the breaks, Curtis Blow, Curtis Blow. No. No? Curtis Lowe, not Curtis Blow. The Ballad of Curtis Lowe by Leonard Skinner. 
Play me a song, Curtis Lowe, Curtis Lowe. I wish that you were here, Sam. Stop, stop. Know. Come on, you're upsetting people. All righty then. So the eight-man tag was the Gun Boys and Gin and Juice against Ricky Starks, FTR, and CM Punk. And they did all these separate entrances and saved Punks for last, and then you heard Lack Mussolini with cheers and booze. And everybody was standing. Some people were cheering. Some people were flipping birds and going, fuck you, fuck you. <laughs> and then the people that were cheering tried to drown out the people that were booing and vice versa. And now they have made it to where that Punk is now not only the biggest baby face, but then also the biggest heel in the company. And it wasn't the EVP's plan with their slander campaign after they got their panties in an uproar because Tony wouldn't powder their pussies by firing the guy that kicked the shit out of them after they put the mouth on him, slandered him, and then instigated a physical confrontation that they were not equipped to handle. And he has done absolutely nothing, he being Tony, to punish the officers of his company who have devalued one of his assets and basically come out and told the most dedicated part of his audience, do not like this guy, don't support this guy, and don't watch this guy, even though he's in our company. Because we're mad, and he's a bad person. But now the guy that was universally being cheered, at, and he's still an attraction. Punk is still it because now he's the most controversial person in wrestling because he's the only person that in, in the business that can get the biggest positive reaction and the biggest negative reaction on the shows that he's on. But it wasn't the EVP's plan to make him attractive in that way. It was their plan to poison him to their fan base so that they wouldn't want to see him and Tony would spend the millions of dollars that he's paying Punk unnecessarily throwing it down a well because he couldn't get his full value out of Punk because he'd been poisoned to the fans. That's what the EVPs tried to do. And it still remains to be seen whether it's going to affect, is it going to affect his merchandise business? And the merchandise he sells are the AEW faithful going to buy Punk's merchandise like they were? That's going to cost Tony money. Are they going to come to buy tickets on Saturday nights, much as the people who like wrestling and want to see a program that makes sense and is not pointed at and written for and catered to children and childish minds? They don't want to go on Wednesday now. They want to go on Saturday. But that wasn't Punk telling them don't support the Wednesday night show. That's just demonstrably we're going to get wrestling on Saturdays, hopefully, rather than childish trampoline cowboy bullshit. So is Tony going to do anything about these motherfuckers that he's paying more money to than they've ever seen in their lives and more money than any of them deserve from a wrestling promoter for their limited talent that they possess. Talking about Hangnail and Maddie and Nikki and old Twinkle Toes and their assorted crew that's even less valuable than they are. How long is Tony going to pay them all that money while they continue to do nothing but cost Tony money by devaluing things he invests in? So the people, every time Punk gets in, the booers want to boo him, then the cheers want to out-cheer the booers, then the booers want to out-boo the cheers, and it gets a reaction, but it's needless and unnecessary. 
all that Maddie and Nikki had to do was take their ass kicking that they asked for and get over it like men. That's all they had to do. Anyway, like last week, this match was the in-ring work and general professionalism was way up compared to anything else on this show or anything else in this company. This is the kind of match that the guns need to be in to learn because they're opposite guys that know what they're doing, pacing and fucking execution and etc. And again, with FTR and Punk in a match, it looks and feels like a wrestling program. And Jen and Juice are holding their own every step of the way. I love Juice Robinson. And the guns, are they have such promise, and they're so animated. And they work so hard, but they need direction that these guys who are more experienced and more talented than the guns' normal opponents gave them. And the match, it moved at 100 miles an hour for a long time, but it flew by because they kept it fresh. It made sense. They didn't bury the referee. Everybody was tagging in and out. There was no extended floor fights. Was there a dive in this fucking thing? Thank God I don't think I saw one. Yes, Cash did the dive at the end of the finish when everybody went crazy. Cash did a dive and it looked like he killed his opponents and him too. Himself, yeah. Yeah. So it was a goddamn wrestling match instead of a bunch of guys on a trampoline jacking off like the California contingent. And then uh, again, the match made sense. They got heat on punk. And finally he made the hot tag to Starks. He made a nice comeback. That's when it broke down into an eight way. And some guys went to the floor and cash did the dive that all, he almost overshot the barricade and everything. But it was during the big build to the finish and the blow off of everything. That's when all the big shit happened. And then Starks hits a spear on everybody. But as he ends up through the ropes head first, Juice nailed him from the floor and he spun into Jay White's finish. Boom. One, two, three. So now the heels have won. And holy shit, where are we going to go from here? Great match again for a main event. Unfortunately, most of this program felt like dynamite instead of what we got last week from Collision, but you can you can see that they're trying with Hobbs getting a decisive win, with Miro getting a short promo where he just, you know, gets his new gimmick over, with the main event delivering in the ring, with even the matches that, weren't very good not just doing all the bullshit that happens on Wednesday night. You can tell they're trying to make this show different, but they do apparently need a, a better line of demarcation crossed in the sand on what talent is going to be allowed on this program. Well, there's the problem. How much of this is going to be an ongoing problem whenever there's a pay-per-view the next day and everyone's in town at the same time. And the, the, Tony forces and... I understand there's there there's financial reasons. You've got a national television show and you want to plug the pay-per-view you've got the next day. It's not Collision's fault that the pay-per-view has a bunch of matches nobody gives a shit about except for the people who would buy it just to see New Japan's Howie the Mailroom Guy. Just random people, but... <sighs> That's why I'm sure he did a lot of this because it's the night before the pay-per-view and they wanted to push it. But, you know, they're going to be preempted on Saturday nights. And Saturday night is always the night before the pay-per-view. So if Collision is going to be a good show except the night before a pay-per-view or except when it's preempted, we might not be able to find it. That's going to be a handicap to overcome. I wish they'd switch nights. Wednesday, they never fucking move anywhere. Can't we have the good show on Wednesday and the shitty show on Saturday? Anyway, we collided with Collision. They're batting 500 so far with two winners of a main event. You know what? I like the energy for the punk match. I know it's not perfect. In a perfect world, he wouldn't have his reputation and 
whatever value to AEW diminished however much it's been diminished by, can't even call it a whisper campaign anymore, the campaign to destroy him. But the John Cena-esque reaction, yeah, I like that. And I don't think, I think the one thing John Cena showed is it doesn't drive people away. You know, that's the kind of thing I'm well, sure, I'm we, sure we his were... merch will be great still. And I'm, you're going to get this kind of weird reaction in certain towns. With Cena, you weren't dealing with a subset of a niche audience. You were dealing with what was still a... If if the WWE audience is, is three times now what AEW's was, during Cena's heyday 15 years ago, it was three times what WWE's audience is now. That was a lot of people, and there was plenty to go around. The people that liked him, the people that didn't like him. Kids would buy his shit. Grown men would boo him, whatever. It was great reaction, but it didn't hurt business. But when you're talking about a much smaller group of people that are AEW followers, you've got your base audience that likes the trampoline cowboys. You've got some significant portion of other people that just like to watch all kinds of wrestling. And then you've got the you know a couple hundred thousand or however many it is that punk brings because they were wrestling fans and they'll follow punk but they haven't been particularly paying that much attention to what's going on these days since he was gone and you can't really afford to run any of those off now it's not bad for punk besides his reputation being slandered by these nimrods he still gets the same amount of money He's on contract, and as we said, now he's the hottest guy on both sides of the roster. He's going to get more reaction, positively or negatively, than anybody else on the card. But again, if I was Tony Khan, I would run these fucking vice presidents over with a car that they worked this hard and this long and right under my nose without me having the balls to do anything about it to poison people from spending money on or wanting to see or pay attention to the biggest star that Tony Khan has in his company because of jealousy. And I can't believe he doesn't take a stick to these motherfuckers. Not just the EVPs. No, all of their, all of their associate associated friends and well, beyond that. Are- Beyond that, Jericho, we heard about some of the things Jericho well, said. Well, I put Jericho in that friend and hanger on camp now because he, hello, fellow kids. He wants to be with the fucking, you know, the problem is now, the problem is now Jericho wants to be with the young kids. Well, the young kids 40 years ago were the ones in wrestling doing all the fucking drinking and drugs and partying and carousing and getting in trouble and kicked out of hotels, all the shit that Jericho's doing now when he's 60. And the kids that are 20 now, they're playing video games and diddling themselves in their hotel room because they don't want to get outed for actually going out and trying to get laid. So that's some kind of goddamn time warp there with old Chris, isn't it? Yeah, they want to go play video games, and meanwhile, Dr. Roxo is getting kicked out of the hotel. Hey, Derek. But anyway, so, yeah. When you were going to make a thought about it, I can't believe Tony hadn't taken a stick to these people. For costing just, him money. I was just going to say, in terms of the slander of CM Punk, it wasn't just the Young Bucks and their friends. Don't forget, there were other people in the company who saw Punk as a threat for one reason or another. But, I, you know, just to focus on the positives here, I'm hoping next week's collision, without pay-per-view the next day, maybe you won't have a lot of the people you don't want to see on that show on that show. Kevin Kelly and Nigel McGuinness, though. Yeah make a lot more of the stuff watchable. And by the way, next week, Dynamite and Collision, are they not both in Hamilton, Ontario? That's right. Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. So approximately a fifth of the number of people that were booing and or cheering for Punk on Collision from Toronto will be there to boo him and and cheer him in Hamilton. They're doing both shows back to back. One's, I guess, Wednesday's live, Thursday's tape, right? Uh, I for think collision. So. I I think so. I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's easy. I thought collision was going to be live every week. I didn't realize it was. No, it's tape. they're taping it in some. I guess because they can't get into Hamilton on Saturday. Hamilton's closed on Saturday. But uh, point being, 
They're going to have small crowds in the same building two nights in a row to see two hopefully very different television programs. We'll see what happens. And that was Collision. And we don't have the ratings because it's fucking Sunday. That's right, and that's, the, uh, that's your show. Well, there you go. Well, we're about done with it. And shit, the sun has come out here in Louisville. And that's a bad thing. Because they say after it stopped raining this morning, if the sun comes out, we get to 90 degrees, then the weather will be horrible tonight. So I'm going to wrap this program up and go dig a hole in the yard to fucking hide in. All right. Any closing thoughts? <laughs> Nothing. That was the closing thoughts. Stay tuned to the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel this week. Forbidden Door Review will be there first. Yes, and maybe last, and maybe only. And we don't know what else we're doing, but in the next week or two, we're going to get our schedule under control. Until then, in the meantime and in between time, for Brian, I'm Jim, and Harley's right here, too. Thank you. Fuck you. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>